to our next item of business, which is a debate on motion 6376 in the name of John Swinney on education governance next steps. I would invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons whenever possible. And I call on to speak to and move the motion in his name. Uh, Presiding officer, two weeks ago I set out the government's vision for education and our proposals for reform. Our ambition is to create a world-class education system where every child has the opportunity to succeed and the gap between our least and most disadvantaged children has closed. However, we cannot realise this ambition alone. The detail of our reforms needs to be developed in close collaboration with our partners in local government, our teachers and professional associations and parents, children and young people. The Scottish Government is fully committed in to doing so as we take forward this work. One element of that approach is to address the concerns expressed by the Education and Skills Committee about a lack of clarity about the process of making policy in education and taking forward its implementation. Our review confirms that the formulation of education policy will be the responsibility of the Scottish Government but I want to establish clearer structures within which implementation of that policy is taken forward. I intend to re replace a number of groups and committees with a Scottish Educational Council that brings together representatives of the Scottish Government, local government agencies, professional associations and other relevant bodies to create a cohesive approach to developing Scottish education. We recognise also that we do not command a parliamentary majority and I'm keen to engage constructively with members of parliament across the political spectrum to reach consensus on the way forward for education. This debate marks an important starting point in those discussions. Presenting officer, there are many strengths in Scottish education, and it is important that these are recognised as we consider further reforms. Many children and young people fulfil their potential. Exam results are very good and improving, and the overwhelming majority of young people leave school to go into a job, training, or to continue their studies. We have excellent teachers who are hardworking and committed to raising attainment for all. But we still face significant challenges as an education system. There is still too much bureaucracy generating unnecessary workload for our teachers, something we are actively tackling to ensure that teachers are literally free to teach. Our PISA and SSLN results highlight that performance has declined on a number of measures. No matter what data we use or which aspect of attainment we look at, there is a clear gap between children from more and less deprived backgrounds. And as Education Scotland noted earlier this year, the quality of education children and young people experience within and across sectors is still too variable. We must address these challenges, and we believe that ambitious system-wide reforms are needed to do this, underpinned by a strong educational rationale. At the heart of our reforms is a simple, powerful premise the best decisions about a child's education are taken by the people who know that child best. Their teachers, head teachers, parents and the young people themselves. We want to put the power to change lives into the hands of those with the expertise and the insight to target interventions at the greatest need. Those who deliver education in our schools are best placed to deliver this approach. To do this, we will empower schools and give them control over what happens in their classrooms. Schools will have a range of new powers guaranteed in a statutory charter for head teachers. Head teachers will be able to choose their school staff and how those staff are managed. Schools will have control over curriculum content and approaches to learning and teaching within a broad national framework because they will know what will work best for the children in their care. Schools will also have greater control over their finances and we have launched a consultation on our proposals for fair funding across the education system. The consultation will run until the 13th of October and I would encourage everyone to respond with their views to this consultation exercise. President Officer, international evidence shows that involving parents, families and communities fully in schools improves attainment. So that is exactly what is at the heart of the government's policy agenda. 
We will enhance parent councils and modernise and strengthen the legislation on parental involvement to enable all parents to play a role in their local school and in their child's learning. Significantly, the contribution to this process by the work undertaken by the National Parent Forum for Scotland in reviewing the existing statute in this respect will substantially inform the agenda the government takes forward. And to ensure that schools interact more effectively with families who find it difficult to engage, we will take steps to ensure that every school will have access to a home-to-school worker to make and maintain such links which are proven to demonstrate as a strong contribution to closing the attainment gap by effectively engaging young people and their families in their education. Children and young people are at the heart of our education system and will strengthen their voice through more effective and consistent pupil participation. Presiding officer, if schools are to, to lead and to be put centrally into the position of leadership, they must be supported to do so by other players within the education system. All other parts of the education system must share a collective responsibility for supporting school improvement and we must work together to provide this in an effective way for our schools. The government's reform agenda envisages a new support structure which will be made up of three key pillars. Enhanced career and development opportunities for teachers, improvement services delivered by new regional collaboratives and support services from local authorities. The first pillar is crucial to ensuring our teachers are strongly supported throughout their careers. Teachers should have the opportunities to develop their careers in a number of different ways, whether in the classroom, in specific curriculum areas, or in leadership roles. The opportunities have narrowed far too much in recent years. Professional learning and development is key to this and an area where we, that we will strengthen. We will streamline and enhance professional learning so that there's a, co a coherent learning offer available to all teachers in Scotland. Of course. Alec Riley, I'm great. Given way, can I say to him that when I speak to teachers in my constituency, they talk about the cuts that are taking place, they talk about workloads where they're completely run off their feet, they talk about class sizes being far too large, and they talk about the need for teaching assistance, and they talk about not having the basic materials to be able to provide teaching and learning to the quality we need to. How is these reforms going to address these issues which seem to me to be a chronic shortage of funding and education in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well, Mr Rowley would have noticed the data yesterday which indicated there had been an increase in educational expenditure by local authorities, which puts more money into the schools that he's talked about. Mr. Well, if Mr Gray would forgive me, I'll answer Mr Rowley's point first. Mr Rowley will also be aware of the contribution of pupil equity funding, which is going into many, many schools in Mr Rowley's uh, area that he represents. And that assists schools in determining what interventions they can support that can help them to tackle um, the issues of attainment. And then finally, in response to Mr Rowley, on the question of workload, the Chamber will be familiar with the efforts that I'm taking to address the issues of workload within the teaching profession. Um, I do not consider that to be um, completed business. There is work that still has to be done, not just by me, but by other parties within the education system, including local authorities. And I uh, obviously encourage local authorities uh, to take forward those steps. I'll give way to Mr Gray if he wishes to. Um, Mr Gray. Uh, Mr Swinney, that uh, he referred to the figures that came out yesterday to ask whether he accepts that the cash increase which those demonstrated once the deflator is applied show a real terms decrease in funding. Cabinet Secretary. M Mr Gray will be familiar with the wider public finance position that, with which the Scottish Government wrestles and I would remind him of the Audit Scotland report which indicated that the support for local government in Scotland had been essentially on a par with the uh, funds available to the Scottish Government uh, as a consequence of the restrictions in public expenditure. So on the core agenda of ensuring that enhanced career and development opportunities are available for teachers, we will also work with the profession to design new career pathways to develop leadership skills, pedagogic expertise and curriculum area special, uh, specialities. We will look also at issues in connection with initial teacher education, uh, where we need to ensure that new teachers are emerging from initial teacher education with consistently well-developed skills to teach new areas, uh, to, to, to teach in key areas, and that must include the core curricular areas as specified within Curriculum for Excellence of Literacy, Numeracy and Health and Wellbeing. 
The second pillar of support will ensure that capacity in our schools is built and strengthened across Scotland. Regional improvement collaboratives will provide dedicated educational improvement through experienced and talented educators involving, but not limited to, schools, teachers, local authorities and Education Scotland. Pooling and strengthening Scotland's education improvement resources in this way will reduce inconsistencies and address a significant lack of capacity which exists in some parts of the country at the present time. The educational rationale for this, if Mr. Balfour, forgive me, I'll, I'll give way in a moment. The educational rationale for this is strong. Teams of professionals with different specialist skills in different curricular areas working together around the needs of schools. Improving the lack of curriculum area support has rightly been welcomed by many in the teaching profession, including the Educational Institute of Scotland. Specialists can give tailored advice on how their curriculum area can contribute to closing the attainment gap in literacy and numeracy. They can work with teachers to give advice on how to apply educational strategies and improvements to the content of their curriculum area. The void that exists between issuing guidance and materials from a national or a local level and how to implement this in the classroom will now be filled by this approach. This is central to our mission to strengthen the Midland Scottish education and to deliver in full on one of the key recommendations of the OECD review. We will work with partners to ensure that the experience of current and emerging partnership working informs the detailed establishment of regional improvement collaboratives and will empower schools and communities to shape the regional offer to meet their improvement needs. The amendment that Parliament has before it today from Tavish Scott opposes top-down regional collaboration and the shifting of further control towards Scottish ministers. I agree with those sentiments. The, age, the agenda of regional collaboratives will be set by the schools within the area. Schools will set out their needs for improvement and the collaborative will work together to deliver these priorities. That fundamentally shifts how support is provided in the system. I'm keen to build on the collaboration that has already emerged between local authorities in the Northern Alliance, which is enhancing educational practice. That is the fundamental driver of our reforms. So I reassure Parliament there will be no top-down approach and no shift of control to Scottish ministers. I, I will do, yes. Ross Greer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking intervention. He, he mentions how he'd like to see more collaboration. In the consultation document, the government acknowledges the response from teachers was that they would like to see more collaboration, but the barrier to it is funding cuts. Would the government like to respond to that, that it's funding cuts that are the barrier to further collaboration, not educational structures? Cabinet Secretary. The, at, the heart, at the heart of the OECD review was a concern about the lack of collaboration within our education system. And what I'm doing here is putting in place the mechanisms to enable that collaboration to happen and to happen at an educational level so that practice is enhanced. And uh, by that measure, we will take the steps to strengthen uh, the delivery of education services in Scotland. Now, the third and final pillar of support, presiding officer, will be provided exclusively by local authorities. The services which local government provide to schools are and will continue to be invaluable. Councils continue to have a crucial role to play with responsibility for a wide range of education services, retaining local accountability and ensuring their schools have the support framework and services they need to thrive. But we must also improve the consistency and the quality of improvement and educational support that is offered to schools across the country. This will mean some change to the current responsibilities of local government, but that is through the medium of collaboration with other local authorities within the system. We believe that this is an opportunity to, for councils to work with partners in schools and across the country to deliver a consistently improving education support service for our schools. They will also have a crucial role to play in the regional collaboratives that are put in place. Presiding officer, these three pillars of support taken together alongside a system that is led by teachers, parents and communities will provide the necessary focus towards closing the poverty-related attainment gap and transforming the lives of children and young people. It's an agenda that sits alongside the other reforms, particularly in relation to pupil equity funding, that the government has already set out that significantly enables schools to be able to address the circumstances and the challenges that face young people within their own localities, and with a particular focus on closing the poverty-related attainment gap. Reform will require collective effort across the system and I'm determined on the government's behalf to work with others to put in place a strong system 
uh, to ensure that we have the necessary reforms undertaken, to ensure that we make Scottish education world class and that we can deliver the fulfilment that every young person and every child in Scotland has the right to deserve. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I call on Liz Smith to speak to move the amendment in her name. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I make it uh, very clear at the start that we will be supporting the motion in the name of John Swinney for the very simple reason that it adopts the line of argument that the Scottish Conservatives have long held about why the status quo within school governance is no longer the credible option. But may I also make it very clear that we do not believe that the reforms proposed go far enough to make good what is wrong in Scottish schools, which is why I have pleasure in moving the amendment in my own name. Presiding officer, despite the reluctance within some ranks of the educational establishment, John Swinney knows only too well that change is now essential. That is because the evidence is incontrovertible. The persistent and long-term problems in literacy and numeracy for far too many of our young people, the fundamental weaknesses in the delivery of the curriculum for excellence and too few teachers to serve the best interests of our young people, felt most acutely in some subject areas and by those who have additional support needs, are the three main areas of concern. Two of these are systemic, which is why no one can possibly argue that all is well in Scottish education. And before we get told that this is the fault of negative media coverage, let's just examine the facts. And let's go back to the point that the Cabinet Secretary said about the OECD and its very comprehensive review of Scottish schools, because it liked many of the attitudes and the general ethos of uh, Scottish schools, but it also said that we were very far removed from being able to deliver on our potential. We know all about the PISA scores, we know all about the literacy and numeracy uh, problems, we know all about the fact that Scotland's poorer children are two to three years behind children from more affluent backgrounds, we know all about uh, too few teachers and some of the difficulties of encouraging people to come in to teacher training, and we also know about the delivery problem within the curriculum for excellence. That is precisely why the review of governance is so important. It is because it offers the opportunity to change where real power lies when it comes to decision making. For far too long, there have been too many obstacles in the way of teachers who want to get on with the job that they are trained to do, and for heads who want more autonomy as a means to deliver much better results for their schools. On too many occasions, they have felt trapped in a myriad of directives, some from national government, some from local government, some from the education agencies, and not always with the same message. These have prevented head teachers from having freedom to take the decisions in their own school. They have constrained choice and diversity, and they have led to a culture of conformity. All of which, have, yes, I will in just a minute. All of which I believe have been a large part of what's gone wrong. The principle of equity to which we all aspire is not the same thing, and it shouldn't be interpreted as the same thing as uniformity of provision. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. Would you accept that some schools, especially in deprived areas, benefit greatly from the support they get from the centre, like from Glasgow City Council Education Department? Elizabeth. Yeah, absolutely. But let me come to the point, and I'll deal with this specifically when I mention the pupil, pupil equity funding, because I think there are real issues about where that power of the initial decision making actually is. Now, as the Cabinet Secretary said, the international evidence is very interesting. It's true about the buy-in of parents and communities, and I think that's very important. But if we also look at the international evidence, evidence, when there is wholesale autonomy for schools, then there is generally a good set of results. What matters for us is what works in terms of delivering higher standards. Not being bound by a one-size-fits-all approach which allows no room for head teachers to demonstrate imagination and creativity or to pursue the different approaches according to the specific educational interests of their own pupils. Scotland's schools cannot th thrive on what is a lowest common denominator. We need a system which delivers excellence because it inspires teachers, parents and young people. Now let me give, me, let me give you one example of where I think this new governance structure could be very helpful. Schools now have the benefit of being able to access the Pupil Equity Fund. A very important reform which we fully support. But the key test is about who has the final say as to how it's spent. Because if things stand at present, it looks like schools will have to work within both national and local government guidelines. And that, Mr Mason, is just a little bit different from the support mechanism that can go with it. They will have more freedom, as I understand it, to make suggestions about how to spend that money, but they will not necessarily be in full command 
of the final decision. And the Scottish Conservatives believe that they should be. Otherwise, the push for greater autonomy will mean nothing. If local and national government can still call some of the shots, head teachers will still face some of the constraints which, we believe, have caused some of the present system to have difficulties. Of course. I'm I'm very interested in the line of argument that Liz Smith is pursuing about pupil equity funding because from my perspective, uh, there is guidance available about how to, uh, to deploy pupil equity funding. But the whole purpose of pupil equity funding is to enable to school, schools to take those decisions for themselves. Now, if Liz Smith is ex experiencing um, practice that is contrary to that, I'd be grateful if she would draw that to my attention because that is not the policy intention of pupil equity funding. I, I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has raised this point because I would like to think that that's true. But in terms of the paper that was written by Frank Lennon about the guidelines that were issued in March of this year, I think local authorities and indeed national government could take a slightly different interpretation. And that's one of the arguments that we're very strong about when it comes to that full autonomy. Now, now, yes, of course. I'm going to say, could you just develop this, because it's, it's a very interesting point, because I, I, I don't actually think that addresses the issue that I'm raising. What I'm saying to Liz Smith is that my policy intention is clear that yes, there is guidance available to help and inform decision making, which I think is welcome by head teachers. But the policy intention is to enable head teachers to take those decisions in consultation with the school community in relation to the children in that school. And I'm inviting Liz Smith, if she has evidence to the contrary, to certainly draw that to my attention, because my policy intention is clear here. Liz Smith. I think the policy intention is clear, Cabinet Secretary, but I'm not sure in terms of the delivery uh, and uh, certainly, if you look at what the educational establishment has said in relation to some of the government reforms, uh, they seem very uncertain about how that delivery might be in practice. I also think when it comes to uh, the Cabinet Secretary's decision to rule out greater diversity of schools, he faces a major issue. Because after almost two years of keeping them waiting, he's told the parents of St Joseph's School, the Al Kalam School, the Glasgow Steiner School, Mirren Park School and the Green Stem School in Mary Cooter and various philanthropists that yes, he is interested in their ideas, but no, he's actually not going to move on that radical agenda. But the irony here, Cabinet Secretary, is that you're turning a blind eye to the evidence about what works. Take Newlands Junior College, for example, a radical departure from the status quo and an institution that is delivering top class results and inspiring others to follow suit. So why can't that principle be extended elsewhere? Many times in this parliament, the Scottish Conservatives have been accused of being ideologically driven when it's come to education. But at every turn, I would argue that what has driven us is what works. Indeed, I would suggest that the very negative reaction to some of the proposed Scottish Government reforms in some sections of the educational establishment is actually more ideologically driven than anything that we have ever proposed. Because we completely reject the assertion that weaker educational performance in Scottish schools is something that's to do with money and resources. It has an impact, but that is not the whole story. But let me also deal very quickly, Cabinet Secretary, with other inconsistencies in the Scottish Government's proposals. And this is about the regional collaboration, and I know my uh, colleagues will come back to this. As I understand it, these are supposed to be a body of professional advice and support. I accept that point. What I do not accept is that the way in which it's been presented, and certainly the way that it's been interpreted, is that there will be some area of bureaucratic input from these regional boards. And I have to say that in terms of Education Scotland, I would have thought it's the job of Education Scotland, if it's properly organised, to provide that support. Because after all, we've spent many, many months in the Education Committee looking at the role of Scotland's agencies, and Education Scotland has been found to be wanting on some of that professional support. Now, let me finish, and I come on this point uh, to the uh, Liberal Amendment on Education Scotland. I was absolutely astonished given the evidence that we had taken at committee when I read that the Cabinet Secretary intends to allow the Inspectorate to remain part of the same body which undertakes curriculum development. His reason for doing so is because he says that inspection is part and parcel of evaluation and improvement. It is, but surely that must be done on an independent basis. Presiding officer, there has not been any doubt in the minds of the Scottish Conservatives that Scotland schools are being held back, not by teachers, not by parents, not by pupils, but by the system. 
a system for which the evidence does not make very happy reading just now, and a system which is far too rigid and too doctrinaire on the principle of one size fits all. As the Cabinet Secretary has said, it is time to change it, but in a way that is much more radical than what's being proposed by the SNP. Thank you. Members are being very generous in giving and taking interventions, but I'm most conscious we're quite pressed for time, just as long as members are aware. I call Ian Gray to speak to remove the amendment in his name. Thank you, President Officer. Before I uh, tempt the Cabinet Secretary to his usual tired and tedious tirade about us never supporting anything he does, uh, and I will, uh, let me establish some common ground. Mr Swinney has made plain that in our schools the status quo is not an option and that change must come, and he's right, because with 4,000 fewer teachers, 1,000 fewer support staff, 700 unfilled vacancies, attainment in literacy, numeracy and science declining, with fewer school leavers going on to a positive destination, and teachers about to ballot for industrial action, something does have to change. But it is not the case that any change will do. The imperative is not reform for reform's sake, but the right reforms for our future's sake. And some of the, the reforms in this document are welcome. We have always supported the Pupil Equity Fund. After all, it's indistinguishable from the Fair Start funding we proposed a year ago in our manifesto. Managed and delivered properly, it does have the potential to be transformational. Uh, we also, in that manifesto a year ago, proposed a new improved chartered teacher scheme. So a uh, new career progression for classroom teachers it is, I think, a very good thing too. The idea of homelink workers uh, seems to us to be a good one, uh, although I hope the formulation access to uh, does not mean that there will not be enough of them to go around and make the difference that they could. But the main thrust of the government's reforms is the structural re reorganisation of how schools are run. And that has been characterised by COSLA as a power grab, by the Times Ed as the great governance guddle, by Keir Bloomer as authoritarian, unwanted, hierarchical, hierarchical and bureaucratic with dysfunction built in. Now the Cabinet Secretary uh, hasn't taken this lying down uh, and he rushed to his plan's defence, scatterbombing op-eds across Saturday's papers with positively stakhanovite diligence. My favourite passage was this one. We need to work with everyone involved in Scottish education and we will continue to listen to what they have to say every step of the way. Presiding officer, I choked on my cornflakes. Is that ironic or is it just taking the mickey? Everyone, everyone involved in education has told the cabinet secretary he is barking up the wrong tree. In 20 years in politics. James Dornan. I uh, thank Mr Gray for taking an intervention. I was chairing a conference last week where uh, Keir Bloomer made the comments that uh, you've mentioned earlier on. Can I just say that he said that he supported the direction that the Scottish Government were, were moving forward and he thought the next steps was a, a good proposal? Ian Gray. The quotes I make are quotes from what he said at the conference, but it's true that Keir Bloomer is actually a friend of much of the direction, much of the direction the Cabinet Secretary has taken. I think that tells you how seriously there must be something wrong with the elements of the proposals that he was talking about. But listen, and we don't need to stick with Keir Bloomer because we have the consultation response. In 20 years in politics, I've never seen a consultation response so clear, so consistent and so damning of a proposal. Widespread support for current governance, apprehension towards further change within the system, no need to fix something not broken, strong opposition to the uniform establishment of educational regions. And the key point, specifically respondents thought that budget cuts and staffing issues were the two key barriers to improvement. And that's the, go no, I'm sorry. That's the government's own summary of the consultation. Parents, teachers, head teachers, councils, educationalists, all united in saying the change we need is more resource, more teachers and less bureaucracy, all saying structural change is not the solution. But what we get is structural change, a new level of bureaucracy, regional directors, system leaders, cluster leaders, increased workload, increased responsibility for head teachers, 
and not a penny more. Now, recruiting head teachers is already a problem. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Gray for giving me. Last week, when I, uh, two weeks ago, when I set out these proposals, Mr Gray gave a welcome to the purpose of regional collaboratives to provide increased educational development resources. Has he changed his position from that? Ian Gray. Let me come to that because it's an important point. But look, recruiting ed teachers and teachers is already a problem. Our teachers already have lower salaries, more class time and bigger classes than the rest of Europe. They are planning strike action already without facing these new responsibilities and yet these changes are uncosted and unfunded. And worse, the new regional bureaucracy threatens to suck resources towards the centre. I have said that cross-council collaboration towards something like the old regional advisory services could support teachers teach. And I have heard what the Cabinet Secretary has said, but I have read his document. And the closer you look at these structures, the less they look like autonomy and pedagogical support, and the more they look like control and centralised command. Mm. We are to have an overarching education council chaired by the Cabinet Secretary, regional directors appointed by the Cabinet Secretary, responsible for preparing and delivering regional plans, answerable to the Chief Executive of, the educa of Education Scotland, who is accountable, of course, to the Cabinet Secretary. And all this is backed by a Sophie's choice of two funding models, either of which will strip out local democratic control of school budgets. And this, driven by a beefed up Education Scotland, as Liz, Liz Smith said, the one bit of the system the consultation said should absolutely be reformed. Presiding officer, this doesn't look like a system designed by someone who trusts teachers to teach, but rather by an education secretary who seeks to run our schools from his office in St Andrew's house. It is not listening to parents and teachers. It is defying them. This isn't strengthening the middle, as the OECD suggested. It is strengthening central control, increasing the pressure and burden on schools and the head teachers, and gutting the middle at local authorities, which should support them. The document quotes Dylan Williams. The only thing that really matters is the quality of the teacher. But there's nothing here about the real change needed. An end to cuts, enough teachers with enough time and enough support, yes, to be the best teachers in the world. That won't be delivered by an education council in Edinburgh. It won't be delivered by regional enforcers of government policy. And it won't be delivered by these next steps. Cabinet Secretary, Take a lesson from the First Minister yesterday. It's time for another policy reset. Time to really listen to parents, teachers and educationists. Not just say that you're listening. Try again, do better and move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call Ross Greer to speak to move amendment 6376.3. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name. If the Scottish Government is serious about closing the multiple attainment gaps, ending inequality and raising standards in education, they need to listen to teachers, to pupils, parents and others with the knowledge and the experience of what works and what doesn't. This education governance review so far, though, has been an exercise in collecting the thoughts, observations and ideas of all those with a stake in Scottish education before roundly ignoring them in pursuit of a significant change which wasn't asked for, is quite clearly opposed and for which there is no evidence that the quality of education will actually improve as a result. The government motion today even calls on them to engage with all parties and stakeholders, including parents and young people, in continuing to develop these plans. But those who responded to the first consultation will be left wondering why they should bother. And we should not forget that some reported that they felt unable to respond to the consultation in the format it was presented in. The Next Steps report on education reform charges ahead with Scottish Government proposals for widespread governance reform against the express wishes of teachers, parents and educationalists. The government's summary of responses acknowledges this quite clearly. In the document, the government recognises that, and I'm quoting, there is widespread support for the current governance system and an apprehension towards further change within the system. And the case for significant changes in governance had not been made. 
On specific proposals, such as the regional governance structure, the response was even more damning and very clear. I quote again, there was strong opposition against the uniform establishment of educational regions, particularly from local authorities, but also from schools, agencies, parent councils and individuals. That is a lot of key players involved with education raising strong opposition to these proposals. So it is alarming to see the government move ahead with the proposals, despite such a negative response. Those people will be wondering why they should bother responding to the next round of consultations on funding models. And I hope the Scottish Government can offer them some reassurance and some evidence that they're actually listening. Given the lack of support amongst those involved in education, the question must be asked who beyond the SNP and the Conservative benches in this Parliament support these proposals? The government quotes Dylan William, a UCL emeritus professor in the report, giving the impression that they're building on his recommendations. But his quote is somewhat out of context. What Professor William actually said is that there are a number of ways to improve education. A number of ways have been attempted, including changes to the governance of schools, precisely what the government is proposing. But that, and I'm quoting again, the net impact at a system level has been close to zero, if not actually zero. Neither does the OECD report that the government commissioned back up the reform agenda. It says, there is no one right system of governance. In principle, nearly all governance structures can be successful in education under the right conditions. So why is the government obsessed with governance reform? And why do they not address the real issues of budget cuts and staff reductions, which have come out so clearly in the responses to their own consultation? It's not just that these proposals are unwanted or unnecessary, they do bring risk. One of the strengths of our education system is its local democratic accountability. That means decisions that are taken at the closest level to the people they affect, whilst allowing for adequate accountability structures. The government's proposals to... Yes. Cabinet Secretary. Mr Gears just made a point which I've made, which is that decisions are most effectively taken about education um, as close to where that education is taking place. So would Mr Greer like to marshal for us his objections to empowering schools to be able to take decisions where they are entrusted with the responsibility of educating our young people. Mr Greer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention. I don't need to marshal the arguments because they're in the government's own consultation document from teachers themselves. Teachers were exceptionally clear about their opposition to what the government is proposing. The proposals to devolve further power down to head teachers and move other responsibilities up so far to a relatively abstract regional body undermine local democratic accountability. And for those of us who believe passionately in local democracy, this is a worrying sign of how little this Sc Scottish government seems to envision the role for our councils. These reforms risk energy and money being wasted on an unnecessary and unwanted reorganisation, one that could easily overburden head teachers. After all, they're being given significantly more administrative responsibilities, but the financial issues still exist. Unless the Scottish Government is willing to reverse a decade's worth of cut budgets, they will still be forcing schools to do more with less. So ask again, why is the government so obsessed with governance reforms that teachers don't actually want? The absence of support amongst those involved in education has already been well highlighted. And as mentioned, it seems the only real support seems to be coming from the Conservative Party. Yes. Bob Doris. I'm just curious, is the member's suggestion that the Green position there should be no reforms to education ever, the status quo is completely acceptable. Mr Greer. No, no one is proposing that, Mr Doris. It's quite clear that no one's proposing that. But these proposals have met with... No, Mr Doris, please let me answer. These proposals have been met with quite clear, quite overwhelming opposition from teachers, from parents, from educationalists. That is not to say that no reform is necessary, but the issues that have been highlighted, that the consultation document very clearly highlights, are issues of resource and workload. They have not been addressed by this government. Please, very briefly. Bob Could, Doris. We, we, we're having a debate here. Would the member suggest what reforms he would like to see? I would quite happily, I have been suggesting what Scottish education needs is a reversal of a decade worth of cuts. It needs those 4,000 4, teachers that have been cut back in the classrooms. It needs those 500 additional support needs teachers back. We know this already. We know it's cuts that have damaged Scottish education. They've been raised repeatedly by teachers and support staff, parents and pupils, and they're highlighted in the responses to the government's consultation. 
Budget issues, staffing issues, these are the problem. It is disappointing to see very little in the government's proposals to actually address these issues. As we said, education has faced years of austerity. I've already mentioned 4,000 fewer teachers. We've mentioned the support staff who've been cut. The staff at local authority level who support them as well. Key areas like additional support needs have seen a reduction in both the teaching and support staff that they so essentially need. And the remaining teachers and support staff are now overstretched. Pupils are being left behind through no fault of these overburdened and under-resourced staff. And the government's response to these concerns seems to be to devolve decision-making to head teachers, but without enough investment, the head teachers will say, uh, face exactly the same problem as the local authorities do right now. It is good to see that some money has been made available. The Pupil Equity Fund is a positive step, though we have issues with its bypassing of local government. The £160 million that the Green MSPs saved for local government in last year's budget helps to address these issues, but there are small steps in the right direction while great strides are being taken in the wrong one. So we ask the government, acknowledge that governance reform is not what Scottish education needs. It is misguided. It does not address the real problems. We can work together to improve our education system. We can give schools and local authorities the resources they need. We can enhance rather than undermine democratic accountability. We can do something in this session of Parliament that we can all be proud of. But it is not this. The Scottish Greens will oppose these governance reforms and will continue arguing for the support that Scottish education actually needs. Thank you, Mr Greer. I call Tabby Scott to speak to move amendment 6376.2. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, does changing the structure of Scottish education tackle attainment? Will it improve literacy and numeracy? Will these proposals encourage more people to teach? If taken in isolation, the answer can only be no. So the government's proposals for who does what must be assessed against everything being done on education. I would rather this debate was on the effectiveness of the National Improvement Plan announced a year ago. That would be about teacher numbers, their workload and what the plan has achieved for Scotland's young people. It would allow Parliament to, be, to debate three factors that we must get right if we are to give Scotland's young people better opportunities in life. The first is the social and economic circumstances of childhood, how kids grow up. All the evidence, both here and internationally, is that these years before school dictate what will happen to every girl and boy. The government proposed a law which will hold councils responsible for supporting teachers in raising attainment. But the government know that attainment is also about social deprivation, poverty, employment and a whole lot more. Now, are councils to have a duty here too? Children from affluent families are 15 months ahead of their deprived peers in literacy and numeracy as they start primary one. So we should encourage and invest in cutting class sizes for schools serving socially deprived areas to under 15. Start with primary one to three and assess what difference that can make. Youth and community work should also be part of that approach. Their role in schools is essential in tackling these social, socioeconomic factors and should be recognized and enhanced. Yeah. Minister. Well, he'll be aware in relation to the vocabulary gap that that is entirely part of the focus of my work in terms of the early years agenda, expanding the amount of early years uh, available, uh, expanding the health visitor pathways, for example, and family supports as well on top of that. So it's about getting that early intervention in place. So there is work ongoing, and he and I have discussed and debated this in the chamber on many occasions. Mr Scott. Oh, and that's all good, presiding officer, but it would also help if the current government had held to their commitment on reducing class sizes in the early years, uh, which many of us thought and still believe is the right approach in tackling the socioeconomic factors that blight too many lives. Uh, the second factor uh, is that teachers and what they achieve in schools matter far more than structural change. Uh, what do the government's proposals do to make space for teachers to teach? Do they create more non-contact time? Do they encourage more people to consider a career in teaching? How will schools be able to recruit to the many vacancies that exist? The enhanced role of head teachers doesn't recognise that for many Scottish schools, head teachers also teach. In Shetland, 15 out of 29 heads spend time in the classroom as part of their working week. How are they meant to do more under these proposals? If the government's island bill is to mean anything, these proposals need to be island-proofed. Island councils would expect no less. The third factor is how these proposals address the fundamental concerns over the implementation of the Curriculum for Excellence, over the central role, in other words, of the government's main education quango, Education Scotland. Now, the government wants to enhance the role of Education Scotland, but there are many strong reasons for doing precisely the opposite, for splitting the organisation in two. On the accountability of the new structure, 
And it cannot make sense to, to make an Education Scotland the boss of that system, a top-down system, with Education Scotland directors in charge of the regional bodies that have been outlined today. Does anyone seriously believe that a head teacher will disagree with the guidance that flows from that structure? How could that head take a different view when she knows that her school will then be inspected by the same organisation? That is what's wrong with making Education Scotland the judge, judge and jury of Scottish schools. Education Scotland will be responsible, is responsible to the Cabinet Secretary. Regional directors are responsible not to Parliament, not to local government, but to Education Scotland. So accountability appears not from schools up, but from the Cabinet Secretary down. It will be a brave head teacher who takes on that structure. How then will curriculum development now happen? Who will question the performance of the SQA? Improvement should be driven by subject teachers across school clusters, working out what works and needs to change. It, it should not be driven by the region down to schools. And before the Cabinet Secretary says that won't... Well, let me give way to that. <laughs> Cabinet well, Secretary. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I can get on my feet quickly enough to catch up with Mr Scott, but it, the, the point I made in my opening remarks was designed to address exactly this question which is about the fact that the regional collaborative is there to support schools in enhancing their educational practice at the behest of schools. It utterly changes on its head, the education system, to make the support available at the behest of the school. It's a Scott. strong argument and needs to be supported by what happens in evidence. And my concern about that approach, about what has happened in the past, is when we had the debate over the number of subjects that our young people should take at higher level, it was the Education Scotland guidance imposed down on schools, which narrowed that choice and made for most education authorities and most schools the choice to narrow it and to make less available to our young people. So my, my concern is that the evidence of how education, and I will give way, my evidence is that Education Scotland's performance over these last numbers of years is quite contrary to that that Mr Swinney has just laid out. Well, I think Cabinet on, Secretary. In, 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 on that point about the guidance from Education Scotland, the issue about the range of subjects used in a school is exactly at the, the type of decision which has been taken at school level, not by Education Scotland guidance. I've had this issue out with Liz Smith over many appearances at question time, where schools have had that flexibility to decide and determine how many qualifications were appropriate in their timetable. That's not specified by Education Scotland in any respect. Mr. But, Scott. but when the inspection regime is one and the same body, there is no ability uh, in the system to test different approaches. And I hope the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary might reflect on that for uh, the future, because the uh, example of uh, workload and, and bureaucracy is telling in this area. In the 52 pages of the government's document, there are but three uh, paragraphs on reducing bureaucracy. Not one reflects the role of Education Scotland. There is no mention of the 20,000 pages of curriculum for excellence guidance that flowed from ed ed Education Scotland into every school. So uh, there is a lot to be done in uh, making the case that it is that Mr Swinney, the Cabinet Secretary, is reversing the whole system when the record of Education Scotland is so clear. And who indeed assesses their role? Who is Education Scotland accountable to? Not in the ministerial sense, we understand that, but for the quality of their work and the value they add to Scottish education. That is the case for splitting the functions. It's not to create a tartan Ofsted. Few, if any, would argue for that. It's about having a body, yes, that examines what's going on in schools. Now, I accept that independent inspection will be difficult for teachers it always will be but an independent inspectorate would also inspect education scotland so if a head teacher wants to try a new approach but has conflicting guidance from education scotland an independent inspector can test both cluster schools quality improvement officers and experience from elsewhere will be part of that an ind independent inspectorate can do that but if the inspector is part of education scotland there will be little pushback check or straight no to education scotland or the regional director and that's i think a decent case for reform. Uh, let me finish with uh, my amendment today, uh, which uh, I think is encapsulated in the uh, interim boss of Education Scotland writing in the Herald, uh, where he says that he doesn't want a turf war over responsibilities. But what indeed does government expect? Because for local government otherwise is to roll over and have powers such as the statutory responsibility for educational improvement removed. Now, many councils, I think as the Cabinet Secretary has accepted in the debate today, actually have those responsibilities, and I haven't heard anyone making a case that they don't do them well. So these proposals, far from 
delivering consensus. Ignore the vast weight of the consultation response that uh, others have mentioned this morning, uh, this afternoon rather, who have argued that the structure should be left alone. We don't need a turf war, and many across education, teachers and parents will believe that would be a waste of valuable time and effort. And it is on that basis the case for reform Thank you. that I make uh, and move my amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we have no time in hand, and so in the open debate, it's speeches of five minutes. I emphasise five minutes. I call Jenny Gilruth, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I remind members I'm the Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I know it's controversial in education, but I was always a fan of homework. As a modern studies teacher, one of my biggest challenges was getting my pupils to engage with the work that we do in here, politics. So at the start of term, I'd ask every class to bring in a piece of news. It could be from the telly, from the internet, from a local paper. And the only two caveats or success criteria I gave them was that it couldn't be about sport and it couldn't be about celebrities. This usually helped to narrow the field. But most importantly, the discussions which followed helped me to do my homework, to get to know my pupils. Presiding officer, when I was elected last May, I made a pledge to my constituents I would do my homework. I, would, I promised to visit every school and to speak to every head teacher about what they thought the challenges of Scottish education were. And despite the regular purge occurrences over the past year, I've managed to visit 23 schools in my constituency so far with seven yet to go. I would like to place on record my thanks to every head teacher I have spoken to for providing me with an honest assessment of where we are. Members may be aware that we used to have subject specialist principal teachers in our secondary schools. Under Curriculum for Excellence, however, there has been a drift quite recently towards faculty heads who have direct accountability over a number of subject areas. For example, as a former PTC in Fife Council, I had responsibility for five subjects, three from out with my own subject specialism. And to make the jump from being a classroom teacher to a faculty head, there was lots of additional experience expected. There was, however, no prescribed leadership route. That's why the first pil pillar of support on offer to our schools is so important, enhanced career and development opportunities. I would have been 12 in 1996 when the regional organisation structures changed, but over the class what I did my homework by speaking to a recently retired and experienced principal teacher. And she told me when she was first appointed, she was faced with four higher classes and little experience of teaching paper two, which for the non-modern studies literate amongst you was formerly the decision-making exercise. Her regional advisor asked what she was most worried about. He then spent an entire day marking her paper two assessments. He then came back to talk to her pupils, providing feedback on where they went wrong and how to improve. She said, that was an amazing experience for me and why subsequent class classes did so well. You can tell, he was my hero. Presiding officer, that education advisor is today the chief executive of the General Teaching Council for Scotland, Ken Muir. What a powerful description of the impact it is possible to have if, as the OECD argue, the middle is strengthened not top-down, as Tavish Scott might like to suggest, but bottom-up. Sharing good practice was the standing item agenda at my own departmental meetings, so if we expect those in front of pupils to talk about what's working well and share it with their colleagues, it's only fair that those further up the tree are expected to do likewise. I can't, I'm limited for time. The collaboratives can and should be used to support staff, as Ken Muir did, providing that professional support and guidance to improve attainment. Our councils will retain control over payroll, HR and democratic accountability for the number of schools in an area, catchments and for appointing head teachers. But our head teachers are the lead learners in schools and in order to lead learning, they should be entrusted as professionals. Just this week, I was in a primary school and the head teacher there told me she's found out she's getting two probationary teachers as of August. She just found out this week. She's worried about the impact that's going to have on her pupils and on her staff in a small, uh, quite rural school. She requested input into that process, but she was ignored. That disempowers head teachers, and frankly, it isn't good enough. Our councils run HR machines, which, in my view, are not always kilter to the needs of our education system. For example, as a PTC, my geography teacher changed three times within the space of nine months. I, as a line manager, my own uh, line manager, the deputy head, and her line manager, the head teacher, had no say whatsoever in this process. Rather, employment decisions in Fife were taken by someone behind a desk in Fife House who was looking to squeeze capacity out of the teaching workforce with no cognizance of how moving staff Members could impact the on minute. the pupils entrusted in their care. Teachers are not square pegs to be used to fill round holes, as one head teacher put it to me this week. You need to get the right fit for your school and for your pupils. And as the OECD evidence stated, school leaders can make a difference in school and student performance if they are granted autonomy to make important decisions. Presiding officer, we all know that the status quo isn't working in Scottish education. If it was, then the attainment gap wouldn't exist. 
You can look at the OECD, you can look at PISA, you can look at SSLN, but fundamentally, if you want to know what's going on in Scottish education right now, I would implore members to go out into their constituencies and to speak to their head teachers. Today is the second last day of the summer term, so I will close by taking the opportunity to wish every head teacher in Mid Fife and Glenrothes a restful and a peaceful summer holiday when it comes. Thank you. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by James Dorn. Mr. Balfour. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President Officer. Uh, like my co colleague Liz Smith, can I welcome in part the uh, way that the Scottish Government is going forward uh, with these proposals. However, I do feel that this is going to be a slightly missed opportunity that we will hopefully at some point in the next couple of years pass these reforms and then realise that in fact we haven't gone far enough and we're going to have to go back to them again and do another change in yet another couple of years. And I think the clear message that has come from head teachers and from teachers as I've spoken to them over the last 12 months is, can we just get it right? And then can we be left alone to get on and do what we're paid to do and manage to teach children? And I think what we definitely need to establish over the next two to three years is a system that will last a generation rather than different parties and different politicians coming back and tinkering with it over and over again. Can I address just two questions and areas in regard to where I think the government is going? The first again comes back to the regional models. It seems clear to me that this regional group will report to Mr Swinney, will report to the Education Minister. That must mean it has some kind of top-heavy structure within mm -hmm. it. It's not reporting down to a local authority. It's not reporting down to local councillors. It's reporting upwards. The, the whole parameters will be set by Scottish Government. And I still do wonder, how can you have localism in somewhere like East Lothian, compared even to West Lothian within my region, and think that uh, one model fits all. And I think there's a real danger that we simply end up with, yes, some more power going to head teachers, which is welcome, but actually just a bigger structure which is further away from parents and children than even we have at the moment. Let me give an example. Will these regional hubs be responsible for school buildings? Will, be, will these be the hubs that decide where a new school building is going to be built? If not, where will that decision be made? Again, I come back to the question that I asked uh, the Deputy First Minister last week in his statement. He said in his uh, speech this afternoon that, and he listed a whole number of people that will be part of this regional hub and others. Will that include local elected councillors? For 11 years, um, I attended uh, a number of uh, school boards here, uh, uh, parent councils here in Edinburgh as a local councillor. I was able to listen to them, take those concerns, and feed them back in to the education department here at Edinburgh Council as a local councillor. Where do I go now? What role would a local councillor have in regard to parent council under this new structure? It seems to me unclear. I think there's a real danger here that we end up with a less uh, localised model. Two very quick uh, points to finish with, Deputy President Officer, and these are genuine questions. The first is with regard to early learning. Where does early learning fit in to the system? Who will actually deliver early learning? Is it going to be the local council or is it going to be the new regional model? And secondly, additional support needs. Again, it seems to me unclear where uh, these uh, children, who are perhaps the most vulnerable in our society, fit in. And there's a real danger that parental uh, access to this big regional body will become even more um, unwieldy. I, I think I'm asking the Members, in time. last minute. Um, let me conclude by, by uh, saying this. This is a step, but it's not a step far enough. And we need to keep moving Forward. And I think there's a danger that this, the, the system that is looking at at the moment will fall through and not actually provide what local parents 
what children want and actually what teachers want either. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Balfour. I call James Dornan, followed by Joanne Lamont. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to begin by taking the opportunity to speak in my capacity as convener of the Education Skills Committee. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's open remarks and look forward to seeing the detail of these proposals. The Committee will, of course, be paying close attention to the Government's proposed reforms. The Parliament will by now be aware of the Education Skills Committee's commitment to hearing from a breadth of voices to inform its work and enhance scrutiny and debate. And, if I say so myself, this has been very effective. And I was pleased to read the Cabinet Secretary's letter to the Committee of 15th of June, in which he said that he had taken account of the Committee's work and the evidence it had received. The Committee has rigorously examined the performance of the principal national agencies in school education and the role in the delivery of curriculum for excellence. The Committee has also highlighted the need for clear lines of accountability in delivering curriculum for excellence. And the Next Steps document indicates that the proposed Scottish Education Council will help to ensure that there is a coherence, pace and challenge at a national level. And the committee will be interested to find out what the Council's responsibilities will be in regards to the delivery of CFE. The broader reforms proposed by the Government represent big changes to the structure of Scottish education. It will therefore be vital that the Education and Skills Committee continues to effectively scrutinise the Scottish Government and its agencies. That includes pre-legislative scrutiny before the Bill comes to Parliament 2018. Yes, of course I will. Just before the member gives me, and I never thought I'd have to say this to you, Mr Dornan, but could you move your microphone closer to you? Yeah. <laughs> Usually I can hear you loud and clear. Can we make sure yes, that the Daniel... minute gets that, because that's the first time you've ever asked me to speak up. Well, be careful. Daniel Johnson. Just reflecting on his comments there, would he agree with me that it's surprising, given our deliberations about the role of the SQA in Education Scotland, that there is no critique or analysis of the Education Scotland or proposed form, and barely any mention of the SQA in these proposals? James Dornan. I think there's lots of good things in this and I, I'll be very interested to hear the Cabinet Secretary when he comes to the committee after the summer with the details of what will be exactly will be in the proposals. Uh, I, I'm sure all members of the committee have noted the recommendation at paragraph 4.4.4 of the Next Step document which emphasises the importance of the SQA listening and being open to the voices of learners, teachers and parents. So I'm delighted, the, I'm delighted that the committee will continue with the inclusive approach we've taken in the last year and that Scotland's parents, teachers and young people will have their voices heard as part of the, the committee's work. I will end this part of the, my contribution with my usual shout out to those with something to say in Scottish education. Uh, please don't wait to be asked the right question in a consultation. We want to hear from you and be led by the issues you raised and full, full details of how to get in touch are on our webpage. I'd now like to speak in my personal capacity and move on to the reforms themselves. There are a number of extremely ambitious goals in this document, goals which can only be achieved, in my view, by changing not only the processes but the culture of the many of the players in Scottish education. And it's not just me that's saying this. Uh, the, uh, the conference that I mentioned earlier uh, on Next Steps, there was general support for a, a change in culture, the, the need for a change in culture. It was highlighted by the aforementioned uh, the, the Keir Bloomer and others. Uh, and, of course, what has to happen is that all parts of the system have to work together. They have to make sure that they, if, if we want education to change, they have to work closely and in a different way from what the, they've been doing so far. And I wish the Cabinet Secretary well with that. They, we also had Mark Priestley from Stirling University uh, who, who said in his comments in a blog recently, finally, we need a culture in our new governance structures that's focused on future improvement rather than one that is wedded to maintaining the sacred cows presented by past structures, methods and guidance. So there is clearly a fair amount of work to be done on that. I'm honestly hugely enthused by the possibilities that stem from the Next Step document, from creating this school and teacher-led system to enhancing career and development opportunities for teachers through to the regional improvement collaboratives. All of these things seem to me eminently sensible suggestions. Of course, as in all things, the devil is in the detail, and I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary using the summer months to come back with those details for both my committee and this chamber to scrutinise as we think appropriate. Given the importance my committee is putting the involvement of all these connected to education, not just practitioners, I'm delighted to see the emphasis the Cabinet Secretary has put on strengthening the voice of parents. And I would have talked about that, but I see him in my last minute. President Officer, they, they address, they, we all agree that education is crucial to life changes of our children. Therefore, nothing this Parliament or Government does can have any greater importance. And I'm hopeful that the positive next steps are allowed to move forward. If all sectors can work together in partnership, I look forward to the necessary changes to education being made to the benefit of all our children. 
and of course seeing this cabinet secretary in front of my committee to answer questions on the details of the proposals and I support the motion. Thank, Thank you. Thank you Mr Dornan. TV to time. Joanne Lamont followed by Gillian Martin. Please. Thank, Thank you very much Deputy Presiding Officer. It is well rehearsed and well established that there are serious problems in Scottish education, a view that has been shaped by the evidence of parents, teachers, support staff, unions, academics and of course international surveys. And there is always a danger um, of being characterised as a curmudgeon by Mr Swinney, willfully refusing to accept what he is deemed to be good news and driven only by a desire to talk Scottish education down. But this debate today is so serious, I am prepared to take that risk. And as ever, I urge Mr Swinney not to shoot the messenger. Um, these proposals do not rise to the challenge faced by education and indeed are in danger of making things worse. Action in government, plans for education must be more than lines to take. And I believe that any proposals brought forward must show an understanding of what the problems are, should be evidence-based with more than assertion to back them up, should be radical in their impact, not defending the status quo, but challenging it, and should be capable of building a consensus in here, within education, amongst families, a confidence that these changes will create greater opportunity for all our young people to thrive and achieve their potential, regardless of their circumstances. And sadly, Mr Swinney's proposals fail all these tests. It's as if, having conceded there is a problem, he's reluctant to recognise what the problem actually is and produces solutions that do not relate to these problems at all. There's no evidence that this plan increases resources where they're so desperately needed, improve recruitment and retention of teachers, address the major problems around supply teachers, support staff, admin support, the lack of specialist teachers, the reduction of subject choices in too many schools and real support for young people with additional support needs. Too many of these young people on part-time tables rather than accessing the full education they achieve. In all of the evidence, and James Dornan is correct to say this, there are loads of evidence before the Education Committee. I have to tell you, I have yet to hear anyone plea, if only we could have more bureaucracy, regional collaboratives, and if only Education Scotland had even more power. In all of the evidence given to us, those proposals were not only not uh, suggested, but would have been roundly denounced. And of course, not only is there no evidence for his proposals, his own consultation rejected most of them. So faced with systemic problems, plagued by too much change poorly introduced, the Cabinet Secretary introduces further upheaval with more bureaucracy, with more power to education Scotland. You could not make it up. And he moves to a view most explicitly argued by Lyd Smith and the Tories that basically educational problems emerge from individual schools and we can solve there. That is simply not true. The attainment gap, the experience of young people with additional support needs, the challenge of recruitment in our rural areas, the experience of working boys, class boys failing in the first and second year of secondary school, the impact of poverty, what a child brings with them into the school. This is about far more than the individual school and its capacity to support individual pupils. The Cabinet Secretary talks about the autonomy of the teacher and the autonomy of the head teacher. I agree with that. There is good practice to liberate their understanding and capacity. But we also have to understand the head teacher, we've been told, might be able to use the resources given to bring in speech and language therapy support. But surely any child, regardless of the school they attend, is entitled to that support if they need it. And if we are saying that head teacher to be liberated on the curriculum, what if the head teacher decides he should only run three hires and will not bother with advanced hires because he doesn't believe or she doesn't believe that that is necessary? We know in politics that a postcard lottery is bad enough, but if you create a lottery based on individual schools, we've got a major problem. We all know. I think the, the Tories uh, take a, a slightly different view. All educational provision and where power lies must be a balance. We have to have standards, collaboration, innovation and the capacity for individual schools to support flexibility. But none of that is of any import if it's not backed up by resources and capacity to the deliver. The in the last 30 seconds. If I can, just in conclusion, Mr Swinney knows the importance of collaboration. 
He has had difficulty collaborating with local authorities. I urge him, don't create a new structure which is answerable to you, but insist that people through our local authorities with democratic accountability enhances and brings together the talent ability across the educational world and our families. I believe seriously and sincerely that these proposals will block that, create a bureaucracy that doesn't work and denies the real pr problem, which is about resource and energy being put into the education system to support our young people. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Tom Mason. Ms Martin, please. Thank you, President Officer. In the government publication, the Education Governance Next Steps, this phrase sticks out for me. It's the responsibility of this government to work with our partners and local government to create the culture and the capacity for teachers and practitioners to improve the learning outcomes in their classrooms. Create the culture, give the capacity. That's what governance should do. The teaching and learning should be the domain of the teachers and the head teachers as leaders in their individual schools. They know what works. They want governments to give them the space, the right support, the right structures to allow them to do that. So how is this government, governance review going to help our teachers achieve uh, this? For one, it's going to address the individual school's need by entrusting key decisions to the head teacher who knows the school, its pupils, their families and their needs best. A head teacher will be able to deploy the Pupil Equity Fund in a way that works for their school. And head teachers I've already spoken to are starting to make plans on how they might use that additional funding. For example, they may use to spend it on an outdoor learning programme because they've seen the benefits that provides. Personally, I'm a big fan of outdoor learning programmes. They may wish to employ additional support specialists if they have a proportion of the children in their care with those needs. They may want to purchase additional learning and teaching aids that the teachers have requested that may help them improve the classroom experience. But it will be for the head teacher to decide. I have the great fortune to be from Aberdeenshire, and I like to talk about ways in which we're always ahead of the curve, and I'm going to do that again now. I was frankly astounded to, to learn that not all head teachers across Scotland are involved in choosing their own staff. In Aberdeenshire, they've always been involved in the recruitment and selection of the teachers, so it was, it was news to me. And also, the governance review recalls for local authorities to get together in regional partnerships. I'm sorry, I don't have time, Daniel. The governance review calls for time uh, for local authorities to get together in regional partnerships for children and family services. I don't have time, I've only got five minutes. Aberdeenshire led the way in setting up one such partnership with the other northern local authorities, the Northern Alliance. It's working very well and it provides, I think, a model for those local authorities who yet to form similar partnerships. And it's not as if in the Green Amendments, talking about taking power away from local authorities, these are not taking power away from local authorities, but sharing good practice across local authorities. The Northern Alliance comprises of Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, Highland, Murray, Orkney Islands, Shetland Islands and the Western Isles Council. Working together helps them share specialist resources, improve outcomes for children by sharing good practice and work together and not compete against other, one another when it looks, they're looking at staff recruitment. One particular strong point um, in the Northern Alliance is the collaboration of head teachers. They've been coming together to reflect on their teaching and learning with one another and discussing the impact that access to data is having an improvement. And they've also done work on finding new ways of working to tackle workload, keeping the family and child at the heart of learning and ensuring an effective evaluation of impact. The, their work is directly linked to closing the poverty and attainment gap. And these clusters are a model of a self-improving system. The Alliance also has teacher development days, which assist greatly in knowledge sharing and uh, resource sharing in CPD amongst teachers in primary stages and in secondary subject areas. Education directors and heads of services also collaborate at their level, agreeing vision and direction and giving support to teaching staff to allow them to make improvements in teaching practice. And the early years and childcare teams are working together with the Scottish Futures Trust, focusing on shared resource, planning and quality improvement work, ahead of the increase in childcare resource for families in this government session. Alliances work, and the government's uh, review's recommendations are a step in the right direction of re regional collaborative team working with teacher at its heart. Uh, I do have a minute just to mention also that um, I want to add uh, that and it stems from Malik Rowley's intervention about the concerns over budgets for education. I'm seeing firsthand how the local authority administration can impact on this. 
Um, as we'll know that the SNP was in alliance with Labour in Aberdeenshire up until the last election. We pledged to keep the education budget as it was, no cuts, we pledged no cuts. And now the new administration is cutting services, most recently cutting visiting specialist teachers. This impacts on attainment, this impacts on teacher workload. And I'm really sorry to say that it's particularly going to affect the very small rural schools that I have in my area, often with teaching heads and very limited actual classroom teachers who rely on this extra experience to come into their, their classrooms. It's at council level that we must ensure that no administration makes cuts to education services. Please conclude. And we must call council administrations who do that out. Thank you. I call Tom Mason to follow by Colin Beattie. This is Mr Mason's first speech to Parliament. Thank you, presiding officer. First, I must declare an interest. I'm currently still a councillor on the Aberdeen City Council. However, to, to avoid doubt, I'll be do donating my local government salary to two charities in Aberdeen. Presiding officer, before I go on to the substantive subject of this debate, I would like to spend a little time on more personal matters. I must congratulate my predecessor, Ross Thompson, on becoming an MP. Ross, who was once also an Aberdeen councillor, will now take on the role of championing Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland down in Westminster. I must pay tribute to the late Alec Johnson, a past stalwart of this parliament. His passing was a devastating loss, not only to our party, but Scottish politics as a whole. <laughs> These events and the magnificent success of getting so many Scottish Conservatives MPs elected from the North East, including two from our list, has allowed me to sit in this chamber today. It was most unexpected, but I am immensely pleased and honoured to be here. Providing of, presiding officer, my welcome here has been, been profound, and I must thank the Chief Executive and his staff for making my entry into the community of Holyrood such a pleasant experience, albeit bewildering at times. I must also thank my colleagues and other members of this chamber across all parties for their welcome. Presiding officer, you will notice I am not in the first flush of youth. But over my 20, 74 years, I've learned many things. I've learned that my wife, Kate, is the most tolerant woman I know, having been put up with me for 40 plus years. I've learned that my two dogs, Fingal and Bran, give me unconditional love for which I do not deserve. In addition, I've learned that youth of today exhibit an energy and an enthusiasm for life, ch change and enterprise that is to be encouraged. And that includes my three children, who never cease to amaze me. I've also learned that most people are honest and well-meaning, and at the end of the day, just want to get on with their lives and just wish to be well-governed. However, much, perhaps more importantly, I have learned that for some people, like, life is just not very, very fair. It is up to us in this chamber and elsewhere to support these people as best we can. Presiding officer of the northeast of Scotland, and more specifically Aberdeen, has been my home for 45 years. The North East is also the home to whiskey, oil, fish, agriculture, and an abundant tourism. And as such, one of the beating hearts of the Scottish economy. So look after us. Which presiding officer brings me on to the, the substantive issue of this debate, the issue of school governance. This is, a, this is a matter that concerns everybody and one which I have particular interest as in. I've been involved with education environment for some 25 years. As my colleagues Liz Smith and Jeremy Balfour have already pointed out, maintaining the status quo in our schools governance is no longer an option for us. I'm very glad, therefore, that John Swinney has finally begun to listen to what the Scottish Conservatives have been arguing on this issue for many years. I'm very clear in my mind that we need to listen to what teachers and parents want for their education of children in their own schools. However, I also believe that reforms by the recent government's review do not go far enough and I believe the government's proposal are regionally, on regional collaboration does not allow for greater diversity in government structures. Presiding officer, I thank you. Thank you. There's nothing wrong with being a septuagenarian, by the way. Uh, I call Colin Beatty to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Presiding officer, recent reports on Scotland's education system have clearly displayed mixed results. The PISA International study highlighted the declining performance in science and reading compared to 2012 
and a deterioration in these subjects since 2006. Numeracy has seen a decline over the years 2011 to 2015 and similarly over 2012 to 16. And it's also clear from the PISA study that despite the Scottish Government's efforts over the past decade, there is still an attainment gap between children from more and less deprived areas. But there's also high points to note. The number of higher level passes has risen by almost 30% since 2007 and passes at advanced level have risen by over 42% in that same period. More than ever, young people are leaving school for positive destinations. In my own constituency of Midlothian North and Musselburgh, it was reported last week that almost 93% of Midlothian pupils went on to positive destinations in 2016, and roughly the same percentage is also seen in East Lothian. It seems clear from this background that we're getting some things right, while other aspects need to be improved. And in order to better understand these issues, last month, the Education and Skills Committee took evidence from 16 individuals who worked in some sort of teaching capacity, and the responses were highly informative. In all careers, employees have to be motivated with a maximum level of support and minimum levels of stress in order to be at their best, and teachers are no different. The individuals the committee spoke to made it clear that there are many issues that can affect teachers' morale. Lack of progression and development and promotion opportunities were highlighted. Uh, head teachers spoke of burnout and running a school and how when colleagues saw the head teacher under such pressure, it deterred them from seeking promotion. There were references to excessive paperwork and in particular as part of SQA inspections and suggestions that there was a lack of trust and respect for teachers on behalf of SQA and Education Scotland. The evidence from these interviews displayed that our teachers could be better supported with subsequent benefit of a higher quality teaching environment for pupils across Scotland. When this is combined with the information provided from the PISA study and elsewhere, the steps outlined in the Scottish Government's Education Governance Review are, I believe, the right ones to strengthen our education system and to continue the positive work done to date. The bottom line of the review is that education will be centred around children and young people while ensuring that the system is led by well-supported schools and teachers. Giving young people a voice in their learning is key to ensuring teaching reflects those being taught. Therefore, the government's taking steps to promote that voice by supporting all schools to encourage pupil participation. And it's intended to consult on a requirement that every school pursues the key principles of such participation this way, children can take an active role in the running of their school, both from an educational perspective and for engagement in the local community. The National Parent Forum's review set out a range of recommendations for how to improve the 2006 Act, and these have helped to inform the next steps. There's an intention to strengthen the duties on schools to fully engage with parent councils, expand sections of the Act to involve parents from an early year setting onwards, and make proposals to extend links between parent councils and pupils. One point that's been strongly made throughout the governance review process is the importance of parental involvement with their child's education out with school. Evidence published by PISA shows that where parents are interested in a pupil's school activities, that child is more likely to want top grades and less likely to report dissatisfaction with their life choices. I welcome the proposal to give every school access to a home to school link worker to ensure that families who need help increasing the level of pupil engagement have that support. This will also allow more parents to become involved at a school development level as well as at home. The Scottish Government is also reflecting on the other non-legislative recommendations made by the National Parent Forum to see what other steps can be taken and I look forward to hearing these proposals in the near future. One of the fundamental principles guiding the governance review is that the people best placed to make decisions about our children's learning are those professionals qualified to do so, including teachers, head teachers, and stakeholders at local authorities. This follows the conclusions that the OECD reached following its examination of the evidence gathered by PISA studies, which stated, at the country level, the greater the number of schools that have the responsibility to define and elaborate their curricula and assessments, the better the performance of the entire school system. President Officer, I believe that the steps that are set out in the review of education governance are the right ones to bring Scotland's education back to where it rightly belongs at the top of the global charts. I look forward to seeing progress being made over the coming years. And I have Daniel Johnson followed by George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The issues and challenges we face in education in Scotland are 
have been well rehearsed and, and well aired today. We have challenges around literacy and numeracy. We have challenges around our standing internationally. We have challenges around resource, the pressure on teachers. And so against this context, of course, we need reform. We need to look at what is going wrong and how we can put it right. And where we agree with the government, we will support the changes that they've brought forward. We agree with the, the proposal around career paths, targeted funding through the Pupil Equity Fund, the support for teaching and indeed parental involvement in schools. But I think there are questions about these reforms. As Joanne Lamont put it very well, but there are questions around the assessment of what those issues that we face are, an assessment of why they have come about, and it is far from clear because it's not demonstrated in the proposal so far, how the proposals will actually make an impact or improve the situation. And I'd like to focus my comments today on the regional collaboratives, because clearly these are going to be the central organisation, the central structure through which the government seeks to, to, to drive its change. And indeed, to, to the extent that these are about supporting teachers, the, the, the aims are laudable. We have indeed lost some of the structures that we once had in our system. Uh, we have a range of sizes and scales of local authorities, some of which struggle to provide the same level of support as others. We've also seen a loss of resource from, from teaching support. But there is a lack of support for these regional structures coming forward from the consultation. And when you look at the structure of what's being proposed, I think there are questions that we need to raise. Now, while the Cabinet Secretary today has stressed that this is about teacher-led, about supporting teachers. When you look at the structures, when you look at what is being proposed, where we'll have regional directors appointed by ministers reporting to the chief inspector, who in turn is being described as the chief education advisor to the cabinet secretary. When you also look at the, the form that this collaboration will take, it will be mandated by statute. Indeed, it will be illegal for local authorities not to collaborate. It's hard to conclude that this is anything other than top-down structures. When you join the dots, this isn't collaboration, it's centralisation. But there are further problems. The OECD pointed out that the need to strengthen the middle, to support teachers. And indeed, if we are going to expand the role of heads, they will need that support. But there is no new resource being proposed. There is there, there, simply what we will be doing is spreading existing resource yet more thinly. Indeed, I think the points raised by Ross Greer and Jeremy Balfour about local accountability, again, are well made. Because what we are seeing through this structure is, is, not in, uh, is a loss of local accountability. We will have regions backed by central government. And in the face of that, it is difficult to see how schools and head teachers will be able to question and challenge, input and discuss uh, uh, recommendations and advice which comes with the backing directly from the Cabinet Secretary and central government. But I think perhaps the most worrying and, and questionable proposition in this is the role for Education Scotland. Because that is where the bulk of these staff will come from. There will be Education Scotland staff, that's who will manage them. And what this means is that the, 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 the regional collaboratives will mean a hugely increased scope for Education Scotland. Not only will they be looking after inspection and education policy, but they will be looking after that practical guidance and implementation of that policy. So if it was questionable for Education Scotland to have that inspection and policy role, surely the, 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 the concerns uh, about that blurred role between inspection and then that practical advice is hugely concerning because what capacity will head teachers have to say no to a regional director who that head teacher knows is employed by Education Scotland, the self-same organisation that might well be knocking on the door the very next day to deliver an inspection. But furthermore, I think and I think, as other members have pointed out, the evidence of the Education Committee questions the effectiveness of Education Scotland itself. Indeed, John Swinney's very first act in coming into his role was to slash the guidance. And who was responsible for that guidance? Education Scotland. When you look at the issues with literacy and numeracy, there are key questions for the central institutions of education policy in the implementation and design of curriculum for excellence. <laughs> but rather than analysing the role of Education for Scotland, looking how it could be changed, it's been rewarded and enhanced. I mean, furthermore, there is no analysis of the role of the SQA or the Curriculum for Excellence Managed Board or any of these other bodies. These have been solely lacking, despite the assertions of the Cabinet Secretary through this year, that the governance review would address the shortcomings and issues that have been identified. Unfortunately, presiding officer, and in conclusion, while there is indeed a need for change, the problem with these reforms is that they do not 
make an assessment of what the issues are. They do not look at, what, at how we can address attainment, the impact of curriculum, for instance, and most importantly, it makes no analysis of the uh, impact of the falling resource levels through funding cuts. And without those, frankly, they, they cannot be supported because simply reorganising will not fix any of those issues. Thank you. Call George Adam to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, President Officer. Can I firstly congratulate Tom Mason on his first speech? Uh, no doubt, regardless of his advancing years, he'll probably hear from him from years to come. Uh, but this debate here today, President Officer, some members will be aware that I was on the Education Committee during the last term. And I haven't spoken during an education debate for some time. Some of my colleagues might say that's been an improvement to education debates, but I'd like to think there's some out there that would think I've still got something that I can actually contribute to. And I'm aware that there's a lot of great work happening in education across Scotland. You know, the, we, we, but we have to move on. We have to look to the future and see how can we do actually better. And there's much in the Scottish Government's document, Education Governance, the next steps, that I find quite familiar from my time on the committee. The most important fact being that education should be centred around teachers, parents and most importantly our children and young people. It also notes the importance of decision making being made as close and as locally as possible. Part of these new statutory powers will result in head teachers, uh, a head teachers charter over choosing school staff, deciding curriculum content with the broad national framework and directly controlling more school funding. One of the issues that constantly came up during my time on the Education Committee was for any system to be successful, you would need parental buy-in. Parents need to take an active role in the school community and we need to encourage that. And it's not all parents that take that active role in school life, but time and again we see the difference this type of involvement can make in a young person's educational attainment. However, it is important that pupils are empowered as well. And that's why I welcome the Scottish Government's plan to strengthen and enhance parent councils and that every school will have a teacher or professional responsible for promoting parental, family and community engagement. Jo uh, Joanna Murphy, Chair of National Parenting Forum, said, we are extremely pleased that Mr Swinney has announced our intention to consult on amendments to the pa uh, Parental Involvement Act as part of the forthcoming Education Bill. We would welcome the introduction of a bill that modernises, expands and strengthens the legislative framework on parental engagement. I think this presiding officer is a very important point. I also believe that we've talked about school communities or schools being part of our community for far too long. But like a lot of other things, we haven't been quite as proactive with our, within our communities as we would have liked. Schools need to be the centre of our communities, ensuring that decisions are made within the local school community by teachers locally can, I believe, help promote that engagement and empower parents, teachers and young people. As a former councillor on Remshire Council and a member of the Education Committee when I was there as well, I know the importance of local democratic accountability and I see these proposals still offer that accountability through our local authorities. But the regional improvement collaboratives give us the opportunity to look at working together. And this is something that local authorities haven't been great at doing. We've talked about it for so long, but they haven't been good at sharing best practice and ensuring that we can actually get that information out there. And strengthening the support of teachers and sharing best practice, I've been supportive of an idea of a body like this for some time. During my time in the Scottish Parliament's Education Committee and at Remshire Council, there's been much talk of sharing be best practice, but there's been little actual examples of it. And I believe that is where this becomes exciting and can become transformational. Building up networks within local authorities and opening up communication between educationalists, finding out who is doing what, where, and what the results have been quickly and sharing that best practice. Nothing in life stands still, and I believe that this type of structure can be a catalyst for new ideas and further strategic thinking. The fact that teachers will be supported by attainment experts and ensuring that there is a pool of talent available for head teachers to choose from when they st is a step in the right direction. But of course, it isn't about reinventing the wheel. As I've already said, presiding officer, there is a lot of great work happening out in local authorities, and local authorities will continue to be the employer, HR, and other support services. But most importantly, the democratic accountability will remain with councils for schools within their area and for appointing new head teachers. 
I've worked with a number of head teachers who, in Renfrewshire Council, there's about four senior head teachers that are leaving, and I've worked with a number of these teachers. One in particular was a head teacher called David Nichols, and he's a head teacher of Glenifer High School in Paisley, and he retires after 40 years in teaching. When we speak of leadership and head teachers, I automatically think of people like David Nichols. David has been involved in education so long that he was at the school when my wife Stacey was a pupil. But what type of expertise, uh, that type of expertise will need to be replaced, and that can be challenging for local authorities. But my opinion is that many of the pills that are proposed by the Scottish Government will encourage the right people to aspire to the role of head teacher, because it's all about what you can do and how you can change young people's lives and giving people the tools to be able to do that. And part of that is the Scottish Government's £750 million attainment programme, which includes the £120 million this year for the pupil equity fund going direct to head teachers. So, presiding officer, it is early days for this plan, but I think the Scottish Government has provided us with a positive place to start, looking at ways we can share best practice, engage with parents, and ensure our children have opportunities to achieve you all they must can close within now. school life. I have Brian Whittle to be followed by Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I declare an interest in that I have a daughter who is a secondary school teacher. I also want to congratulate Tom Mason on his first speech in this chamber. So can I begin by welcoming, welcoming John Swinney's indicated direction of travel today. And I do recognise that this direction has long been championed by Liz Smith and her team on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives when it comes to school governance. I do think it's refreshing that every now and again the government can be seen to take ideas from around the chamber, even if the source of said inspiration for change perhaps remains officially undisclosed. But you will be happy to know, Mr Swinney, we magnanimously accept our part in helping the government shape its thinking. Having said that, that this, this cross-party agreement it, it, it may be positive, I would also have to note that his proposals don't go nearly as far as we would like them to go. Perhaps we should describe these plans as being similar to the standard of a certain low-cost airline promising to go somewhere but coming to land some distance away from the place <laughs> you expected. Onward travel still required to get to the destination you desire. Now, by now, the, I think the Chamber would be surprised if I didn't take a moment in this speech to discuss the Pupil Equity Fund and its potential use in areas like outdoor learning. I think the Fund is in many ways a reflection of the Cabinet Secretary's wider reform agenda. The pro proposal at its core is a sound one, but it remains to be seen, as, as Liz Smith has said, if it does exactly what it's intended to do. And I do note that the Cabinet Secretary has expressed his support uh, to me in our discussions, shall I say, in this chamber before about using equity funding to support things like outdoor learning and, importantly, transport costs for school trips. You know, several conversations with bodies such as the National Trust for Scotland and RSP, RSPB Scotland have highlighted the declining numbers of schools visiting their sites in recent years, with the most common reason being given as a cost of transport. And as we know, outdoor learning at time, learning outside the classroom can have benefits to learn inside the classroom and physical activity leading to improved focus and fresh air and physical fitness benefiting mental health and concentration. Now, some will question whether it's the best use of time and funds, and those people who see education as pupils sitting neatly in rows in a classroom all day, every day. But it should be, as has been discussed, a decision for teachers as how to best deploy these funds for the benefit of their charges. And that kind of brings me to the sort of regional improvement collaboratives, which, as has been expressed in this chamber, is perhaps another layer of bureaucracy. There is an uncomfortable sense that the creation of these collaboratives means schools will be swapping one point of central control for another. Mm. So it is important that we understand how close to the school the decision-making process will be. As is often the case with politics, it's not necessarily the policy itself, but the implementation of that policy that defines its impact. True. With that in mind, and I think Tab Tabby Scott mentioned this, when it comes to Education Scotland, the proposals seem to call for them to be both referee and player when it comes to curriculum development. And I wonder how if it, uh, the Cabinet Secretary would expect Education Scotland to be seen as an impartial auditor of the curriculum yep. when it bears some of the responsibility for its creation. And again, as Liz Piff has, hi has highlighted before, I would like to talk about Newlands Junior College as an example of greater autonomous approach, a demonstration of what can be done when new ideas and innovation are allowed into education mm. to address a problem. And I was pleased to have visited that college last year to see what they were doing firsthand. And they are taking disenfranchised young people and helping them to find purpose 
and direction, ultimately going on to positive destillations and, and positively inputting into their communities. But no one is suggesting for a moment that the same idea should be applied across the country. But of course, that's the beauty of offering greater autonomy. Mm. It doesn't have to be. Specific solutions to address specific problems. The need for a pragmatic approach, the need to do what works versus the constant desire for that uniquely Scottish solution. The challenges in the Scottish education system are not uniquely unique to Scotland. Other nations have experienced them and acted. We know what works, but instead of simply taking the big, bold leap, if you, leap, if you like, we're presented with a somewhat watered-down alternative, a kind of decaf autonomy, same appearance, not enough kick. Without education system needs more than anything is innovation. Giving schools greater autonomy gives head teachers greater opportunity to try new things and tailor their approach to the particular circumstances of their pupils and staff. The world pupils enter when they leave school continues to evolve. The curriculum for excellence does appear to recognise that the range of skills pupils need when they leave school has changed significantly, particularly in an economy where you are now considerably less likely to have the same job for the duration of your life. If I conclude with a, a quote from Frederick Nietzsche, the surest way to corrupt a youth is to instruct him to hold a higher regard for those who think alike and those who, than those who think differently. They need to think differently. Every stu student is an individual. Teachers and head, head teachers need that headroom, that flexibility to get the best out of their pupils and ensure that youngsters have every opportunity to succeed. The last of the open debate contributions is from Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I firstly declare an interest as a board member of CERC and also congratulate Thomas Mason on his maiden speech or his, his first speech in the Parliament today. Um, can I also empathise with his comments about his dogs? I only have one dog. And also his wife, as someone who has lived for 20 years with a now retired teacher and union rep, I feel I have a unique insight into today's proceedings. I want to concentrate in the short time we have on um, the funding issues that have been talked about this afternoon. And we should remember that the fair funding to achieve excellence and equity in education consultation document is out at the moment. Um, and I would welcome and encourage people to contribute to that consultation. And in the opening um, uh, statement, uh, the Cabinet Secretary said, we are clear that in order to deliver this transformational change to our education system, it must be underpinned by fair and transparent funding that puts schools at the heart of decision making the way we fund schools needs to recognise the crucial role of the school and support the collaborative and flexible culture we are seeking to develop. And um, we must also remember that um, the Accounts Commission published in 2014 a report that suggested it was how local authorities decided to spend their education budget rather than overall spending, which had most impact on attainment levels. And it was um, about getting the funding to the people most in need that mattered. And this is what this governance review is all about. It's about a school and teacher-led education with the pupil at its centre and with the decisions about those pupils being taken closest to them. In order to talk about the future and where we might go with this, I have to talk about what is happening right now in my local area. Um, North Lanarkshire Council, who are a Labour administration supported um, into administration by the Tories, uh, attempted to divert PEF funding from the control of their head teachers and use it to backfill some of their own education cuts, something thankfully that was prevented by this government. Um, but the resulting position is that 198 classroom assistant posts have been uh, deleted uh, from North Lanarkshire, um, having a devastating impact on um, the schools and the pupils that will be affected by this decision. Now, for years, years we heard in this um, chamber that the council tax freeze was underfunded over and over again, a claim that I refuted and, of course, the Cabinet Secretary in his previous role refuted as well. And um, when the local authorities were given the opportunity to be able to use the council tax, um, the, the opportunity to raise that by up to 3% to fund such services, of course, North Lanarkshire was one of those who chose not to do so. So we want head teachers to have the autonomy, not only to determine how PEF is used, but to, in tackling difficult and persistent attainment problems, but also for head teachers to be able to focus on the key business of learning and teaching. 
So the development of a fair, more consistent and transparent targeted method of allocating funding is to the benefit, would be to the benefit of all our pupils. And the, the, uh, the document produced by the government has two options. One would be a legislative, more standardised, wide approach to allocating maximum amount of funding directly to schools. Or uh, the second option would be to build on the success of the pupil equity funding approach, targeting the greater proportion of funding directly to schools based on specific needs factors known to impact on performance and for outcomes. So the majority of school funding will continue to be challenged through local authorities. That democratic accountability will not be impacted by this. Who will continue to have a role in ensuring the public resources for education are properly accounted for? No, I'm sorry, I don't have time today. Um, but specifically, the new regime will be consistent and transparent. Empowering head teachers to focus on the key business of learning and teaching is absolutely imperative. They must have the autonomy and they will be consulted in developing and moving forward. Head Teachers Charter will be developed in consultation with the, the head teachers and they will be able to benefit from the regional support and collaboration to ensure that throughout Scotland, all our head teachers will have support and advice to ensure excellence in curriculum, excellence in learning, excellence in teaching and excellence in assessment. Thank you, President Officer. We now move to the closing speeches. It's disappointing to note that not all of those who contributed to this debate are in the chamber for the beginning of the closing speeches. And I call on Tavish Scott. No more than six minutes, please. Oh, I don't entirely blame them, presiding officer, but there we are. Um, can I, uh, uh, may I also congratulate Thomas Mason on his uh, first speech in, in this parliament, and also his very kind words, oh, he's not here, but there we are, um, uh, and also his very kind words, uh, which uh, many of us who've known Alec Johnson a long time or knew Alec Johnson a long time would entirely uh, relate to. Uh, the other uh, uh, moment of, um, I wanted to start with, too, uh, given we're talking about young people, or at least we're trying to have a debate about uh, young people, is, is a 17 year old Seamus Mackay, who last night won the Island Games 800 metres. I mention that because he beat an athlete Brian Whittle used to coach as well. So uh, uh, I, I c just couldn't resist that uh, because. <laughs> because, uh, and, and even worse, Liam MacArthur was there to watch it and not me, but there we are. Um, uh, this has been a, an important debate and, and important maybe for these uh, two points. Firstly, that uh, Liz Smith, uh, Ian Gray, Daniel Johnson, and indeed many uh, others across Parliament today have recognised that there is merit in uh, the proposals that uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary and the Government are making to do. I do too. Uh, but what I believe a number of us are doing uh, is accepting that uh, while there is merit, there are, there are concerns and that those concerns are principally based on the evidence that, uh, that uh, a number of us have heard in the Education Committee over the previous year. And I hope that Mr Swinney would at least accept that many of us are being entirely consistent about the uh, point that we have made uh, on those concerns, and in particular about Education Scotland. And that is the basis for uh, the, basis for, uh, the questions uh, that we are asking uh, of the government here today. And as Joanne Lamont rightly says, uh, don't shoot the messenger, at least recognise the concerns that have been there over some period of time. Now, uh, there are significant challenges for Scottish education and members of all political persuasions, I think, have fairly uh, set them out. And I'm sure the government accept, even privately, uh, that teacher vacancies, the need for uh, more classroom assistance, the pressure on additional support needs, uh, the financial pressures, yes, on classrooms, uh, and the attractiveness of the teaching profession to undergraduates and to people thinking of changing profession are all real factors, uh, really significant issues. Uh, and do need to be constantly worked on, which is why I made the uh, point about the National Improvement Plan and the importance of Parliament uh, keeping regularly on top of that as to what's happening. Jenny Gilruth was uh, quite right. Uh, I, I, she uh, will be uh, true of, I suspect, every member in this uh, chamber. They're not only about the importance of visiting schools, uh, which arguably, in my view, is the best part of this job, uh, but also about listening uh, carefully to, the, uh, to classroom teachers, to subject teachers and to head teachers. Uh, and they have said, uh, as I, and I'm sure I'm not the only member, they have said consistently again over this past year that implementing Curriculum for Excellence, uh, the change to the exam structure and the workload pressures of the three aspects of education uh, and of their jobs that have come, come at them uh, so uh, significantly 
significantly and uh, consistently over this past year, which is why uh, we've all sought to, or many of us have sought to make the point about the realism of the challenge uh, that, we, uh, that, uh, that Scottish education faces. But I do want to be clear about uh, my support for the direction of travel, about schools being at the heart of, of, the, of any reforms, uh, and the importance of the right support, the right support uh, around schools to, in, to allow that to uh, happen. And many of us have made the case for uh, school clusters and for the importance of that structure which can work and does work very effectively. Uh, Gillian Martin made the point about the Northern Alliance uh, and its role and uh, she was right in what she uh, argued. Uh, my question in that context again to the Cabinet Secretary and something I'm sure we'll debate in the autumn uh, when Parliament comes back and after he has issued further clarity and consultation around this is that his proposals if I read them correctly are for a mandatory um, uh, regional structure and for uh, a mandatory responsibility on local government to uh, collaborate in, in those regional uh, structures. Now the Northern Alliance appears to me to be a structure that's working very effectively without any need to make it uh, mandatory. Uh, again, as Joanne Lamont rightly put it and as others have said in committee, if, uh, the, the, there will need to be evidence which backs up uh, the suggestion that not all is working effectively in different parts of Scotland. Now that evidence uh, may be there and it is uh, for the Cabinet Secretary to lay that out to um, the Education and Skills Committee and indeed of course uh, to Parliament. But my uh, one point I want to just uh, reflect on is the, is the case uh, for um, uh, for reform in education Scotland. I think George Adam, or maybe Bob Doris rightly, I think it was in fairness Bob Doris, uh, rightly asked questions about those of, us, um, not, uh, those of us who need to argue for reform as well. What is our proposal? That's an entirely uh, fair question. Uh, but I've believed for some many months that uh, Education Scotland is uh, a conflicted organisation given those two roles and responsibilities that it have that appear to me to be quite uh, distinct. And it was difficult for Bill Maxwell, the previous Chief Executive, coming along to committee and seeking to argue and to hold together that in inherent contradiction uh, and I hope that, no, no f uh, that his successor and whoever Mr Swinney appoints in the fullness of time will not have that same contradiction and that's why many of us have made this case because we believe that is fundamental uh, to a sensible and constructive reform that does and is about supporting schools uh, rather than leaving in place a situation which I do not believe would be the right form of challenge to improvement uh, that demonstrably all of us would be in favour of achieving. Two final points, presiding officer, if I may. The uh, James Dornan, has, in his capacity as convener of the committee, uh, made a strong argument in favour in, in, in terms of um, teachers responding both to um, the proposals that are being made but also to the committee. Uh, I believe that's had merit in the past and I think it'll, be, it'll have a strong merit in the context of reviewing these proposals. Uh, and finally, uh, to uh, Brian Whittle, who, who, who made uh, essentially the point about these kind of reforms, that it's not just about the policy, it's about the implementation uh, that matters. That indeed will be the test of what is now being proposed. Call Ross Greer, no more than six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like colleagues, I'd like to congratulate Tom Mason on making his first speech in this chamber. The, the sense of privilege of being here and having the opportunity to do so certainly hasn't worn off for me over a year into the job. The Greens are open to working with the government to improve Scottish education, even if we believe these proposals to be fundamentally misguided. Whilst we're opposed to the general direction of the reforms, I would like to offer some areas where we can work with the government or where we believe we can. Initial ed teacher education does need to improve. It needs to become more consistent, particularly in areas such as equipping teachers to support pupils with additional support needs. I don't underestimate how difficult it will be to do this while respecting the independence of our universities, but I look forward to seeing what the Scottish Government proposes Pose. And I agree that routes for career development need improved. I've regularly heard feedback from teachers who wish to progress their career without making an immediate leap into management, like Jenny Goruth highlighted. Members will be aware of my particular insistence for pupils with additional support needs uh, to have that support significantly improved. As our understanding of additional needs has developed, so has our ability to identify pupils who need that extra support. We now recognise that one in four Scottish pupils has an additional support need, though these range from very low levels of support required, for example, uh, for pupils with mild dyslexia, to the high levels of support required for pupils with more significant learning disabilities or, or physical disabilities. But this nationwide figure of one in four varies considerably from one local authority to another. It's less than one in 10 in South Ayrshire, it's more than one in three in the Highlands. The variation is too high to be natural. 
It has also become clear that there must be enhanced quality assurance procedures for the provision of additional support needs. When considering the enhanced role for Education Scotland, or preferably, which I'll come to later, a distinct inspectorate, thought must be given to how or if support for these additional needs are being provided, to how inspections can properly assess this and ensure that there is not a postcode lottery for proper support. However, let me be clear, even if these issues are addressed, they do not tackle the most pressing challenges for Scottish education, which are, by the government's own consultation responses, budget cuts and staff-related issues such as workload. This government now faces the result of 10 years' worth of budget cuts. We could, and we have, spent more than one afternoon debating the nature of where these cuts came from and if they're fair, but I'd rather look to what we can do now. We have the tax raising and financial powers to put money back into education. It is a matter of political choice if we do not use them and instead see the number of cut teachers and support staff grow. The Greens will be supporting the Labour Amendment, particularly as it makes this point about restoring budgets and staff numbers. Now, Bob Doris asked us about reforms that the Greens would support. We support an evidence-led approach and simply do not see the evidence for these wholesale structural reforms. It's certainly not in the government's own documents. But one reform that we would support, as I mentioned, is the end of Education Scotland's inherent conflict of interest by the creation of a separate independent inspectorate. As such, we'll be supporting their amendment today. Brief. Yes, briefly, please. Bob Doris. I was wondering if you support proposals in relation to who makes final decisions in employing uh, uh, teachers, head teachers, sometimes restricted to whether they can award permanent contracts, and they sometimes have to accept surplus teachers from elsewhere in the local authority, rather than making positive, proactive choices on appointing teachers themselves. Is that something that you would consider movement on? Ross Greer. We have significant concerns about that proposal to move uh, that employment responsibility to head teachers. I've lodged a number of written questions on that, so I would like to come back in a future debate once I've had those answers. At this point, we're not minded to support that. Now, uh, colleagues may recall that we didn't actually support uh, Tavish Scott's proposal the last time that he brought it to the Chamber to split the roles of Education Scotland, but we did pledge to seriously consider it. We've done that now, and we believe that that argument has merit. Gillian Martin mentioned the Green Amendment and refuted that um, this, these proposals take power away from councils as we say they do. Well, councils strongly disagree, and they're right. You cannot pretend that moving powers down to overburdened head teachers and up to these unaccountable regional structures leave councils with the same responsibility that they had before. They will have significantly less power and responsibility, and they are a democratically accountable body. One particular concern which has been raised with me is the priority given to Gaelic medium education with a weakened local government role. I hope the Scottish Government will take this on board. But the issue so far in this process has been the Scottish Government not taking on board concerns and feedback. Jenny Gilruth quite rightly asked us to go out and speak to teachers. But teachers have spoken quite clearly, directly to the government through this consultation. The government's own documents note the overwhelming opposition to these proposals, but that they will carry on regardless. The Scottish government cannot claim that they do not know what the problems are. Through the consultation, through multiple reports in the Education Committee, work undertaken by teaching unions and others, the problems of budget cuts, of staff reductions and workload are clear. We can fix them. But these proposals do not aim to do so. And they will take us in a direction that the Conservatives may be comfortable with. But too many in education, too many of those with a significant stake in education, teachers, parents, pupils, educationalists, professional bodies, are simply not comfortable with this direction of travel, and neither are we. The Scottish Government need to think again if they are serious about improving Scottish education rather than simply centralising control over it. The Greens will be opposing the Government's motion today. I call Monica Lennon. No more than six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I extend our congratulations to Thomas Mason on his election and in making his first speech in this important debate. In his opening remarks, Mr Swinney said that he wants a world-class education system and who would disagree? We have heard in the Chamber today that there is consensus around the need for change to improve standards in the education system and to give our young learners the opportunities they deserve. deserve. Things cannot go on as they are. Ian Gray, in moving the amendment in his name, explained why Scottish Labour believes the status quo just won't do. But we fundamentally disagree with the Cabinet Secretary's diagnosis and prescription. So unlike the Tories, we won't be supporting the Scottish Government motion and we certainly won't be supporting the Tory amendments. The Cabinet Secretary's own consultation 
was a golden opportunity to listen with an open mind to what people working in our school communities have to say and to develop a reform package based on what they know will work rather than what won't work. When my daughter, who, by the way, unlike Jenny Gilbreth, isn't a fan of homework and would like the Cabinet Secretary to make it go away, but when she was at nursery school, the early teacher used to encourage the class to put their listening ears on. It's a lesson that would have served the Scottish Government well, because if the responses to the consultation had been properly listened to, then we would be having a very different debate today. Ross Greer uh, made the points very, very well that the reforms have clearly been opposed and there is no evidence to back up the plan the Cabinet Secretary has settled on. Simply moving the existing education resource around without delivering the urgent investment required to support learning in the classroom will contribute nothing towards closing the attainment gap. We heard from Alex Rowley uh, about the impact of cuts and there's been lots of welcome for the Pupil Equity Fund. But it only amounts to spin if there isn't an honesty about the deep cuts that already have been enforced. There is nothing in these proposals that directly addresses the key concerns raised in the consultation process. Staffing issues and budget cuts are the key barriers to educational improvement. Despite the spin, the focus of these reforms is structural and centralising. And the result of creating an overarching education council directly answerable to the government with regional directors appointed by the cabinet secretary will only lead to the removal of local accountability and more bureaucracy. The exact opposite of what is intended. And that is why the cabinet secretary should stop, listen and reset his plans. This government have had a decade in power. Ten privileged years to look after the education of our children and give them the best possible start. <coughs> Excuse me. And yet in those 10 years, we have seen falling education budgets and falling attainment. It begs the question, where are the progressive SNP voices? Who in the SNP is speaking out about the underlying issues of inadequate resources? Who in the SNP is prepared to admit that imposing unnecessary bureaucratic reform will not raise standards or close the attainment gap? And it is our children again who will continue to pay the price. The facts speak for themselves. 4,000 fewer teachers, 1,000 less support staff, even bigger class sizes than when this government came to power. And spending per pupil across all ages is down since 2012. Well, Mr Donnan wouldn't take mine, but I don't know if it's a convener hat or his member's hat. I'm gladly... Uh, well, this, James this, this one's with my member's hat on. Could you just clarify for me whose responsibility it is to hire and fire teachers and, and support staff? Monica Lennon. Mr Dornan had an opportunity earlier on in his speech when he used the privilege of his position as education convener to really be honest about the debate that we're having, but he switches between his hats very, very neatly. What we do need to close the attainment gap is urgent investment, and I think Mr Dornan would agree with that if he was prepared to be honest. Urgent investment in our classrooms and our schools. That's how to deliver high quality pupil centred learning. We need more teaching staff. These reforms largely appear to offer nothing more than bureaucratic, top down restructuring of the system, which will have little effect on helping our teachers do their job on the ground. And Daniel Johnson made an excellent point. Where is the analysis of the impact of falling resources? We've not a single extra teacher or a single extra penny promised to deliver these reforms. It's very difficult to see how these system-based reforms will remedy the issue of resources, teacher numbers and teacher time. What we do welcome from these reforms is the opportunity for enhanced career development opportunities for teachers, delivery of the Pupil Equity Fund and emphasis on parental involvement by enhancing family learning and the role of home link workers, homeschool like workers. I've previously asked the Cabinet Secretary in the Chamber for more information on how many homeschool link workers will be recruited. Any update he can provide would be appreciated. 
In terms of head teachers, these reforms offer significant new powers for head teachers, but we do need clarity on the scope and scale of these new powers as the head teacher charter progresses. Without clear guidelines on accountability and responsibility for providing HR support, these changes, and I hope Mr Dornan is listening, will put even more risk and burden on our teachers rather than reducing it. And there's a number of former teachers in the chamber who should be alive to those risks. Additionally, any procurement... You must close, Ms Lynn. OK, finally then, Deputy Presiding Officer, we've entered into this because we all want to uh, tackle the attainment gap. But what we've seen is that in black and white, the government's own consultation responses have largely been ignored. The Cabinet Secretary needs to ditch these plans uh, and urgently you must return close. to Parliament with concerns of teachers, parents and... Ms Lennon, you must address. close. Thank you. I call Graham Simpson. Uh, no more than seven minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, can I also uh, um, praise Tom Mason for his uh, maiden speech and congratulate him for uh, bucking a trend in this chamber and being well within time. Um, I'm sure it won't, won't catch on. Now, way back in March 2013, the Commission on School Reform published a detailed document called By Diverse Means. Headed by Keir Bloomer and consisting of cross-party representation, I was the Conservative rep, as well as experts with no party baggage. It was a serious and detailed attempt to suggest ways in which we could improve Scotland's educational performance. Nothing has happened since to do that. We've got worse. Our paper started with two quotes. By diverse means we arrive at the same end, from the French philosopher Montaigne and never tell people how to do things, tell them what to do and they will surprise you with their ingenuity from General George S. Patton. In other words, trust people to do a job and allow them to do it in different ways. It was clear then and clear now that the education system in Scotland is too uniform. Maybe not for Labour whose position in this debate has been unclear uh, even more unclear after Monica Lennon's contribution. Um, so that uniformity is why the Scottish Conservatives have been arguing for years that we need greater diversity in the system and that we need to empower properly head teachers. Mm -hmm. On that last point, it's good to see the SNP has finally arrived at the table, talking about autonomy, leaving teachers free to teach and involving parents more. But, of course, the devil, as always, is in the detail. And when you look at it, uh, it starts to unravel. The background, as Liz Smith, John Swinney and Colin Beatty have all said, is that our educational performance uh, is in the see me after school category. Our standing internationally has declined since the SNP came to power. This was highlighted last year by the PISA scores, which Liz Smith recounted. And just at the weekend, we learned that more than half of school leavers last year did not have a maths qualification at National 5 or above. If education really was this government's top priority, we would not be in this position. The Commission on School Reform argued that only through promoting increased variety in the system would we see future improvement. The way to achieve that would be through increasing the autonomy of schools. But what is autonomy? John Swinney uses the word but I wonder if he understands it or even wants it. O autonomy is freedom from external control or influence, the right of an organization to govern itself. So that would mean, for example, schools being able to commission services from whoever they choose. That would be genuine autonomy. Is that what John Swinney is proposing? The answer is no. If you wanted to design a system that was more bureaucratic and centralized, than the one we now have, then you would need look no further than the Cabinet Secretary's blueprint. If John Swinney was a localism proponent, he would be saying to the parents at St. Joseph's Primary in Mulgai that they are free to make their school autonomous from state control if that's what they want. But he isn't. He would not be setting up an extra layer of governance, the regional improvement collaboratives, reportable and accountable, not to locally elected members, but to him. 
When I suggested this might be the arrangement to Mr. Swinney in the chamber recently, he denied it. But here's the evidence from his own paper. When describing how these giant new bodies would be run, it said they would be, quote, led by a regional director to be appointed by the Scottish Government and provide a direct line of accountability for the performance of the regional improvement collaboratives to ministers. So there we have it. John Swinney appoints the regional directors and they're answerable to him. Any pretense that this is about empowering anyone other than John Swinney, despite his earlier protestations, is a smokescreen. Your children's education in the hands of Mr. Swinney and woe betide anyone who steps out of line. What will these new bodies, up to seven of them, actually do? They'll provide educational improvement support. They'll produce an annual regional plan and associated work programme. And councils will have to meet a new legislative duty to collaborate on certain functions. What's left for local government in all this? It's been stripped of powers. Councils will be left with a few admin functions and HR. What's the point of having education committees anymore? Or as Jeremy Balfour said, education directors. There isn't any. Daniel Johnson, who wanted to intervene, uh, rightly mentioned the loss of local accountability. He's entirely right. Now John Swinney talks about empowering head teachers, something the Scottish Conservatives have been calling for for years. The generous Mr. Swinney is going to allow them to choose their staff, decide on curriculum content, which they can do anyway, and have control over more of their funding, though not all of it. But just in case anyone has any ideas above their station, he warns darkly in that same paper, the freedom for head teachers to choose the staffing mix and management structure within their schools could have implications for the national pupil-teacher ratio, which suggests to me that heads can't decide on staffing numbers. That's not true autonomy. Gillian Martin seems to think otherwise. Presiding officer, John Swinney wants to create a system where schools will be answerable to two bodies and ultimately to him. He's stripping councils of powers and going down a regionalization route. We can be certain that this is the route the SNP wants to go down with council services full stop. We do need auto more autonomy in schools. We need choice. This is not it. And I hope John Swinney is really prepared to listen to the many voices in this chamber. I call on John Swinney to wind up this debate. Up to nine minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, let me begin by extending my uh, words of welcome to Tom Mason on his uh, introduction to Parliament and his first speech in this debate today. And may I wish him well on his, to the task that he committed himself to of representing constituents in the northeast of Scotland. And can I also associate myself very much with his kind words about Alec Johnson, who was uh, very much uh, a colleague within this Parliament who uh, displayed all the attributes of a fine parliamentarian in working with members across uh, all uh, aspects of the political spectrum and uh, is dearly missed within Parliament uh, by all of us. Um, in the, the one thing which has been crystal clear to me since I became the Education Secretary 12 months ago is that there is a, a diversity of opinion about what to do in education. And uh, that has been on display across the chamber today. And I think that's, that, that is an, it's, it's, not, it's not meant to be a, a funny remark, but uh, although I do appreciate my natural hilarity in front of the <laughs> chamber, uh, it is a statement of the reality of the debate, that there isn't a true holy grail about what is absolutely the right thing to do. Which is why I started off my remarks by saying the government is interested in working with others to address the issues that are contained within the governance review. But if I can gently point out to the Conservatives, there is a little bit of a natural contradiction in some of the arguments that they have marshaled today, marshaled just by Graham Simpson and also by Jeremy Balfour, with the arguments of Brian Whittle and Liz Smith. Brian Whittle and Liz Smith argued very strongly about giving ever more power to head teachers, much more power than is envisaged under this, which would naturally have to come from somewhere, which would be local authorities, 
and Graham Simpson and um, uh, Jeremy Balfour made the argument for the preservation of local, th local authority power and responsibility. So I'm all for a diversity of opinion, but I simply point out to Parliament that's a bit of a challenge for even me to reconcile on the, branch, on the front bench of the Conservative Party. Now, uh, of course I will, yes. Graham Simpson. So it's really just for uh, Mr Swinney's uh, clarity. Um, what we're saying is these new regional bodies uh, amount to greater centralisation and not autonomy. Head teachers will be answerable to regional bodies, not locally accounted uh, elected members. John Swinney. I want to talk about the regional collaboratives in a second. Now, the accusation has been made that I, I well, it's been inferred that I don't listen to, to teachers or to members of the teaching profession. I, I want to make it clear to Parliament that I spend a significant amount of my time listening to teachers, to head teachers, to many members of the profession uh, on the, uh, the, the very frequent visits I make to schools around the country in private opportunities for me to speak to teachers. And many of the issues that have been raised with me by teachers are the reasons why the proposals are what they are before Parliament today. Because the areas of agreement that we have today, and there are, despite all the differences of opinion, there are actually a lot of agreement here, that there is a commitment from the government to empower teachers and to put schools at the heart of the reforms and to empower head teachers. These are all sentiments that have been expressed to me by teachers and made powerfully to me by teachers. Of course. Ian Gray. We've had this discussion before when the Education Committee gathered evidence from teachers uh, and the Cabinet Secretary dismissed that evidence and said that he had spoken to teachers uh, and they agreed with him. Now we have the government's own formal consultation process which disagrees with him, uh, but he posits to us the idea that all the teachers he speaks to on his visits support what he's doing. Can you see that's not a valid way to govern? John Swinney. Well, pe people can't, on the one hand, accuse me of not listening to teachers and then accuse me of listening to teachers at the same time, which is precisely what I'm doing in this process. Now, to look at some of the other areas of agreement, let's look at the, the issues around, around regional collaboratives. Because Joanne Lamont made a, a, a comment, well, Ian Gray has made a, a point that he uh, can see merit in the regional collaboratives to provide educational improvement services, and that's the purpose of those regional collaboratives. Joanne Lamont made the point, and I, I think I heard her correctly, but if I've misquoted her, she can correct me. Um, she made the case for requiring collaboration between local authorities. And that's the point that was made powerfully by George Adam in his own contribution. Because George Adam made the point that local authorities have not been good at sharing best practice. The Northern Alliance that Mr Scott talked about is a voluntary collaboration, and I welcome it. But I pose, in, in one moment, it, but I pose the question, it's the only effective collaboration in the country. And I'm in, receive, in receipt of advice, as is Parliament, from Education Scotland and from the Accounts Commission, both of which highlight weaknesses in educational improvement services offered at local authority level. And the regional collaboratives are an attempt by me to try to address those issues to ensure that every school in the country, no matter where they are, has access to regional improvement services. I'll give way to Joanne Lamont. Joanne Lamont. Characterisation that there isn't collaboration. In fact, I go back far enough to regional councils where there's very good examples of liberation at a local level, but um, work across uh, councils. We have a problem with fragmented local authorities. My point is the, the model that you produce is one that's highly bureaucratic. It hurts your brain even to read what is doing there. What we should be doing is to work to the best instincts of people to work together. And there's a lot of that very good practice already there. John Swinney. In a sense, I, I agree with the sentiments underlying Joanne Lamont's intervention. Um, the, the, I want to see liberation at local level in schools, but I want to see collaboration about best practice across a wider canvas. And it doesn't exist in sufficient abundance or sufficient depth today. And that's not just my opinion, that's the assessment of Education Scotland and the Accounts Commission into the bargain. Now clearly, and there's other agreement today, around parental involvement where our proposals have been warmly welcomed by the National Parent Forum and also about career progression pathways. So I take from this debate quite a substantial amount of agreement about the details, but I do accept there are issues to be addressed 
about regional collaboratives and about the role of Education Scotland, and particularly the issues raised in Tavish Scott's amendment, which is what I, it's why I set out in my opening remarks the fact that we're not going to have top-down regional collaboration, shifting power towards ministers. That's not what we want. And also, um, I will give way yep, to uh, Ms Forbes. So, Keith Forbes. Can the Deputy First Minister outline how his plans around school governance will build momentum around Gaelic medium education? Because it is, of course, right to put more money and power into the hands of schools and teachers. Cabinet Secretary. Well, that's, that would remain a key responsibility for local authorities as part of the process. And uh, we set out in the, con in the document the role that we would expect local authorities to take forward, an important role to strengthen and to develop these aspects of educational practice. So in my comments earlier on, I made the point that we wouldn't be having top-down regional collaboration. Um, and also, well, Mr Gray, forgives me, I've got to draw my remarks to a close. Um, and we certainly, and what I also clarified is that education policy will be res the responsibility of the Scottish Government. That is who owns responsibility for education policy. It's not owned by Education Scotland. It is owned by me as the Cabinet Secretary, responsible in that respect. So I have no problem with the amendment from Tavish Scott because these issues are issues that we will, uh, that, that, that we will satisfactorily address. Now, finally, Presiding Officer, Ian Gray, and I'm sorry I can't take an intervention from Mr Gray, but he accused me of wanting to run schools from St Andrew's House and of not trusting teachers. I just want to put it on the record to Parliament today. I have no desire to run schools from St Andrew's House. I have every desire to trust teachers which is why I'm bringing forward proposals to empower teachers and to empower the teaching profession. But what I do want to see is I want to see an active, all-system approach to improving the capacity and the capability of Scottish education for one important purpose, to transform the life chances of every single young person in our country. That's at the heart of the proposals that we bring forward, and that's why the government will talk to interested parties about how we advance the level of agreement that we have in Parliament today to take forward and to implement these reforms. Thank you. That concludes our debate on education governance. The next item of business is consideration of motion 6346 on the Code of Conduct for Members and Motion 6347 on the interests of members. And I call on Claire Adamson to speak to and move the motions on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Standards, Procedures and Public Appointment Committee has reviewed the Code of Conduct for members of the Scottish Parliament and the written statement form that members are required to complete when registering interests. We felt that the Code could be more streamlined and user-friendly, and we wish to avoid the confusion which sometimes arises between what constitutes an enforceable rule of the code and what is provided as guidance and best practice. I am happy to reassure the Chamber that none of the rules within the code has been altered or removed, but the wording of some has been altered where we felt this could provide greater clarity. Our report, Code of Conduct for MSPs and Written Statement Revisions, sets out the recommended changes and we propose that existing four volume structure be replaced with a single code of conduct document which is succinct as possible and a companion guidance document. The new format of the code means that the determination by which the Parliament agreed the format and content of the written statement needs to be updated. We also took the opportunity to make some minor textual changes to the form which mean it reflects more closely the legislation governing registration of interests. The new written statement form is annexed to the motion and appears in Annex B of the committee's report. All MSPs have been consulted in the revised determination as required by the sta standing orders. Members, as ever, will be able to seek advice from the standards clerks on all matters relating to the Code of Conduct and the Register of Interest. And, Presiding Officer, I move the motions in my name. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of business motions 6423, 6424 and 6425, which set out a business programme and the timetables for two bills at stage one. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motions to say so now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motions on block. Moved on block. Thank you very much. And no member has asked to speak against the motions. 
Uh, therefore, put the questions to the Chamber. The question is that we agree motions 6423, 6424 and 6425. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you, we are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of seven Parliamentary Bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move motions 6426, 6427, 6428 on approval of SSIs. Motion 6429 and 6430 on designation of lead committees. And motion 6434 and 6435 on committee membership and substitution on committees. Moved all together. Thank you very much. So there are eight questions in total to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that amendment 6376.1 in the name of Liz Smith which seeks to amend motion 6376 in the name of John Swinney on education governance next steps be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to division and members may cast their votes now. question is that amendment 6376.4 in the name of Ian Gray, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of John Swinney, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment to the name of Ian Gray is yes, 30, no, 93. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 6376.3 in the name of Ross Greer, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of John Swinney, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed. We move to a division and members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of Ross Greer is yes, 30, no, 92. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 6376.2 in the name of Tavish Scott, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of John Swinney, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. <laughs> the, the next question... The next question is that motion 6376 in the name of John Swinney as amended on education governance next steps be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 6346 in the name of Claire. The next question is that motion 6346 in the name of Claire Adamson on the code of conduct for members and written statement revision be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yeah. Yes, point of order, Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When you asked for a verbal uh, vote on the government's motion as amended, we said no. There was a division. Okay. I didn't hear it. I did look over because I thought I heard it and I looked over again. However, we will rerun that vote if members will, if members wish to. I think it's only fair to make sure we record an accurate vote. 
So we'll put the question once more. The question is that motion 6376, in the name of John Swinney, as amended on education governance next steps, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed, therefore we'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of the vote on motion 6376 in the name of John Swinney as amended is yes 96, no 27. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And I would urge, I don't normally ask members to speak up, but in this case I would ask members to speak up, please. The next question, the next question is that motion 6346, and this is just for clarity to make sure we're agreed, the name of Claire Adamson on the Code of Conduct for Members of Written Statement Revision be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 6347 in the name of Claire Adamson on the interests of members of the Scottish Parliament Act 2006 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. And I propose to ask a single question on seven parliamentary motions. If any member objects, please say so now. No members objecting. Therefore, the question is that motions 6426 to 6430 and 6434 to 6435, all in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of James Kelly. I will just take a few moments for members to change seats.